Chapter Seventeen of Good Stories for Great Birthdays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Good Stories for Great Birthdays by Francis Jenkins Olcott. April Thirteenth, Thomas Jefferson, the Framer of the Declaration of Independence. All honor to Jefferson to the man who in the concrete pressure of a struggle for national independence by a single people had the coolness forecast and capacity to introduce into a merely revolutionary document an abstract truth applicable to all men and all times and so to embalm it there that to-day and in all coming days it shall be a rebuke and a stumbling block to the very harbingers of reappearing tyranny and oppression abraham lincoln the fourth of july eighteen twenty six is it the fourth no not yet they answered but twill soon be early morn we will wake you if you slumber when the day begins to dawn then the statesman left the present lived again amid the past saw perhaps the peopled future lived again amid the past till the flashes of the morning lit the far horizon low and the sun's rays o'er the forest in the east began to glow evening in majestic shadows fell upon the fortress's walls sweetly were the last bells ringing on the james and on the charles mid the choruses of freedom two departed victors lay one beside the blue ravanna one by massachusetts bay Hezekiah butterworth condensed thomas jefferson was born in virginia april thirteenth seventeen forty three framed the declaration of independence seventeen seventy six was elected governor of virginia seventeen seventy nine appointed secretary of state in washington's cabinet seventeen eighty nine elected third president of the united states eighteen hundred he died on the fiftieth anniversary of the signing of the declaration of independence the fourth of july eighteen twenty six he was called the sage of monticello monticello was the name of his fine country estate the boy owner of shadwell farm thomas jefferson was a boy of seventeen tall raw-boned freckled and sandy-haired he came to williamsburg from the far west of virginia to enter the college of william and mary with his large feet and hands his thick wrists and prominent cheekbones and chin he could not have been accounted handsome or graceful he is described however as a fresh bright healthy-looking youth as straight as a gun-barrel sinewy and strong with that alertness of movement which comes of early familiarity with saddle gun canoe and minuet his teeth too were perfect his eyes which were of hazel gray were beaming and expressive his home shadwell farm was a hundred and fifty miles to the northwest of williamsburg among the mountains of central virginia it was a plain spacious farmhouse a story and a half high with four large rooms and a wide entry on the ground floor and many garret chambers above the farm was nineteen hundred acres of land part of it densely wooded and some of it so steep and rocky as to be unfit for cultivation the farm was tilled by thirty slaves and thomas jefferson this student of seventeen through the death of his father was already the head of the family and under a guardian the owner of shadwell farm the best portion of his father's estate his father peter jefferson had been a wonder of physical force and stature he had the strength of three strong men two hogsheads of tobacco each weighing a thousand pounds he could raise at once from their sides and stand them upright when surveying in the wilderness he could tire out his assistants and tire out his mules then eat his mules and still press on sleeping alone by night in a hollow tree to the howling of the wolves till his task was done from this natural chief of men thomas jefferson derived his stature his erectness and his bodily strength james parton arranged a christmas guest shadwell farm was a good farm to grow up on thomas jefferson and his noisy crowd of schoolfellows hunted on a mountain near by which abounded in deer turkeys foxes and other game jefferson was a keen hunter eager for a fox swift of foot and sound of wind coming in fresh and alert after a long day's clamoring hunt he studied hard 
for he liked books as much as fox hunting soon he began to be impatient to enter college then too he had never seen a town nor even a village of twenty houses and he was curious to know something of the great world his guardian consenting he bade farewell to his mother and sisters and set off for williamsburg a five days long ride from his home but just before he started for college he stayed over the holidays at a merry house in hanover county where he met for the first time a jovial blade named patrick henry noted then only for fiddling dancing mimicry and practical jokes jefferson and henry became great friends jefferson had not a suspicion of the wonderful talent that lay undeveloped in the prime mover of all the fun of that merry company while as little doubtless did patrick henry see in this slender sandy-haired lad a political leader and associate yet only a few years later in may seventeen sixty five patrick henry was elected a member of the house of burgesses and jefferson was to become a brilliant law student in seventeen seventy five jefferson was elected a delegate to the continental congress that declared the independence of the united states of america james parton arranged the author of the declaration the english settlers of virginia brought with them english rights and liberties the settlers and their descendants were forever to enjoy all liberties franchises and immunities enjoyed by englishmen in england they received from england the right to make their own laws if not contrary to the laws of england it was the governor of virginia who summoned the first representative assembly that ever met in america the first american colonial legislature this happened about a year before the pilgrim fathers reached the new world and drew up the mayflower compact it was not strange therefore that thomas jefferson born and reared in the atmosphere of virginia freedom should have been a patriot who fearlessly defended american liberty he was also a man of unusual intellectual power and a writer of elegant prose so when congress appointed a committee to draft the declaration of independence he was made a member of that committee when the committee met the other members asked thomas jefferson to compose the draft he did so the committee admired his draft so much that with but few changes they submitted it to congress after a fiery debate some alterations being made congress adopted thomas jefferson's draft as the declaration of independence of the united states of america proclaim liberty july fourth seventeen seventy six the declaration was signed america was free joyously the great bell in the steeple of the state house of philadelphia swung its iron tongue and pealed forth the glad news proclaiming liberty throughout all the land the tidings spread from city to city from village to village from farm to farm there was shouting rejoicing bonfires and thanksgiving copies of the declaration were sent to all the states washington had it proclaimed at the head of his troops while far away in the wax haws nine-year-old andrew jackson read it aloud to an eager crowd of backwoods settlers the great bell the liberty bell that had proclaimed liberty was carefully treasured Today it may be seen in independence hall as the old state house is now called around the crown of the liberty bell are inscribed the words which god almighty commanded the hebrews to proclaim to all the hebrew people every fifty years so that they should not oppress one another proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof twenty-three years before the declaration of independence was signed these prophetic words from the bible had been inscribed upon the crown of that great bell only a reprieve fondly do we hope fervently do we pray that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away yet if god wills that it continue until all the wealth piled by the bondsman's two hundred and fifty years of unrequited toil shall be sunk and until every drop of blood drawn by the lash shall be paid by another drawn with the sword as was said three thousand years ago so still it must be said the judgments of the lord are true and righteous altogether abraham lincoln there were two statements in the declaration of independence which must have profoundly disturbed its signers all men are created equal and have the right to life liberty and the pursuit of happiness many of the signers were slaveholders 
thomas jefferson of virginia the framer of the declaration was an abolitionist and an active one throwing the weight of his great influence against the institution of slavery he earnestly believed that all men white and black alike are born equal so when he was asked to frame the declaration of independence he put into it a clause condemning the slave trade as an assemblage of horrors during the debate in the convention this clause was stricken out though jefferson had his reasons for not freeing his own slaves he continued to speak and write against slavery as a violation of human rights and liberties this abomination must have an end he said there were other americans who believed as he did george washington in his will left their freedom to his slaves to be given them after his wife's death he ordered a fund to be set aside for the support of all his old and sick slaves and he bade his heirs see to it that the young negroes were taught to read and write and to carry on some useful occupation kosciusko was jefferson's intimate friend and like him a believer in freedom for all men without regard to race or color before he left america kosciusko made a will turning over his american property to jefferson for the purchase of slaves from their owners and for their education so that when free they might earn their living and become worthy citizens from the time of jefferson until the civil war slavery to be or not to be was the burning question men and women especially those belonging to the society of friends devoted their lives to the abolition of slavery many of these abolitionists were mobbed and otherwise persecuted because of their humane efforts william lloyd garrison was the great leader of the abolitionists the quaker poet whittier was also a leader in the agitation against slavery but to go back to thomas jefferson when the missouri compromise went into effect and the house was divided against itself jefferson was deeply and terribly stirred he looked far into the future this momentous question he wrote like a fire bell in the night awakened and filled me with terror i considered it at once as the knell of the union it is hushed indeed for the moment but this is a reprieve only not a final sentence and again he said i tremble for my country when i reflect that god is just that his justice cannot sleep for ever first the reprieve then as the crime was continued the execution of the sentence nearly a hundred years of slavery passed after the framing of the declaration then on north and south fell the terrible retributive punishment of the civil war on the fourth of july eighteen twenty six it was the fourth of july the fiftieth anniversary of the signing of the declaration of independence in his home at monticello thomas jefferson had closed his eyes for ever on the fourth of july the fiftieth anniversary of the signing of the declaration of independence End of chapter 17chapter 18 of good stories for great birthdays this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by betty b good stories for great birthdays by francis jenkins olcott may twenty ninth patrick henry the orator of the war for independence i know not what course others may take but as for me give me liberty or give me death patrick henry to the reader whether independence will prove a blessing or a curse will depend upon the use our people make of the blessings which a gracious god hath bestowed on us if they are wise they will be great and happy if they are of a contrary character they will be miserable righteousness alone can exalt them at a nation reader whoever thou art remember this and in thy sphere practice virtue thyself and encourage it in others patrick henry patrick henry was born in virginia may twenty ninth seventeen thirty six he was elected governor of virginia seventeen seventy six he died june sixth seventeen ninety nine the order of the war for independence a surprise to all in seventeen sixty five there was an important meeting of the house of burgesses of virginia 
as the law-making body of that colony was called they had come together to debate upon a great question that of the stamp act passed by the british parliament for the taxation of the colonies most of the members were opposed to it but they were timid and doubtful and dreadfully afraid of saying or doing something that might offend the king they talked all round the subject but were as afraid to come close to it as if it had been a chained wolf they were almost ready to adjourn with nothing done when a tall and slender young man a new and insignificant member whom few knew rose in his seat and began to speak upon the subject some of the rich and aristocratic members looked upon him with indignation what did this nobody mean in meddling with so weighty a subject as that before them and which they had already fully debated but their indignation did not trouble the young man he began by offering a series of resolutions in which he maintained that only the burgesses and the governor had the right to tax the people and that the stamp act was contrary to the constitution of the colony and therefore was void this was a bold resolution no one else had dared to go so far it scared many of the members and a great storm of opposition arose but the young man would not yield he began to speak and soon there was flowing from his lips a stream of eloquence that took every one by surprise never had such glowing words been heard in that old hall his force and enthusiasm shook the whole assembly finally wrought up to the highest pitch of indignant patriotism he thundered out the memorable words caesar had his brutus charles the first his cromwell and george the third treason treason cried some of the excited members but the order went on may profit by their example if this be treason make the most of it his boldness carried the day his words were irresistible the resolutions were adopted virginia took a decided stand and patrick henry the orator from that time was of first rank among american speakers a zealous and daring patriot he had made himself a power among the people a failure that was a success who was this man that had dared hurl defiance at the king a few years before he had been looked upon as one of the most insignificant of men a failure in everything he undertook an awkward ill-dressed slovenly lazy fellow who could not even speak the king's english correctly he was little better than a tavern lounger most of his time being spent in hunting and fishing in playing the flute and violin and in telling amusing stories he had tried farming and failed he had made a pretense of studying law and gained admittance to the bar though his legal knowledge was very slight having almost nothing to do in the law he spent most of his time helping about the tavern at hanover courthouse kept by his father-in-law who supported him and his family for he had married early one day there came up a case in court which all of the leading lawyers had refused what was the surprise of the people when the story went around that patrick henry had offered himself on the defendant's side his taking up the case was a joke to most of them and a general burst of laughter followed the news yet patrick henry won the case he was a made man he no longer had to lounge in his office waiting for business plenty of it came to him he set himself for the first time to an earnest study of the law he improved his command of language the dormant powers of his mind rapidly unfolded two years after pleading his first case he was elected a member of the house of burgesses we have seen how in this body he set the ball of the revolution rolling give me liberty or give me death patrick henry in his spirit stirring oration before the house of burgesses had put himself on record for all time his defiance of the king stamped him as a warrior who had thrown his shield away and thenceforward would fight only with the sword the patriot leaders welcomed him he worked with thomas jefferson and others upon the committee of correspondence which sought to spread the story of political events through the colonies he was sent to philadelphia as a member of the first continental congress in fact he became one of the most active and ardent of american patriots it was in seventeen seventy five that patrick henry in a convention presented resolutions in favor 
of an open appeal to arms to this the more timid spirits made strong opposition the fight at lexington had not yet taken place but henry's prophetic gaze saw it coming in a burst of flaming eloquence he laid bare the tyranny of parliament and king declared that there was nothing left but to fight and ended with an outburst thrilling in its force and intensity there is no retreat but in submission and slavery our chains are forged their clanking may be heard on the plains of boston the war is inevitable and let it come i repeat it sir let it come it is in vain sir to extenuate the matter gentlemen may cry peace peace but there is no peace the war is actually begun the next gale that sweeps from the north will bring to our ears the clash of resounding arms our brethren are already in the field why stand we here idle what is it that gentlemen wish what would they have is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery forbid it almighty god i know not what course others may take but as for me give me liberty or give me death charles morris condensed facing danger it was the last day of august seventeen seventy four the potomac was flowing lazily past mount vernon the door of the large mansion on the high river bank stood open before it were three horses saddled and bridled three men came out of the house one was george washington large handsome resolute dressed for a long journey with him was a tall angular raw-boned man slightly stooping carelessly dressed whose dark deep-set eyes flashed with peculiar brilliance the third man was equally striking in appearance well proportioned and graceful his face serene and thoughtful the tall raw-boned man with deep glowing eyes was patrick henry the elegant stranger edmund pendleton they were two of virginia's most devoted patriots as the three vaulted into their saddles washington's wife stood in the open doorway trying to conceal her anxiety for him under a cheerful manner her heart was very heavy but as the three gave spurs to their horses she called out god be with you gentlemen and so they rode away it was dangerous business on which they were bent as martha washington well knew they were going to attend the first continental congress at philadelphia they were about to defy england but the three rode away from mount vernon fearlessly with their words ringing in their ears god be with you gentlemen End of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of good stories for great birthdays this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org good stories for great birthdays by francis jenkins alcott june ninth francisco de miranda of venezuela the flaming son of liberty he took part in three great political movements of his age the independence of the united states of north america the french revolution and the independence of south america from an inscription to miranda by the venezuelan government the prince of filibusters the chief of the apostles of spanish american independence and one of the founders of the republic of venezuela francisco de miranda will long live in song and story the career of this knight errant of venezuela has fired the imagination of many filibusters and revolutionists william spence robertson miranda was born in venezuela june ninth seventeen fifty six flew venezuela's first flag of freedom the red yellow and blue march twelfth eighteen o six signed the declaration of independence of venezuela july fifth eighteen eleven he died in Spanish chains, July 14, 1816. The Spanish Galleons 1. Have you ever read the voyages and adventures of the handsome young Amias Lee, who sailed the Spanish main with the sea wolf, Sir Francis Drake? Have you read of Ayacanora, the Indian princess with the blowgun, of Salvation Yo, of the Lost Rose of Devon? of the old mono of panama 
and how Amias and his fellows seized a gold pack train and captured a Spanish treasure galleon? One of the most thrilling tales of adventure of Spanish gold and Spanish galleons is Westward Ho, the story of Amias Lee, but before the days of Amias, Knight of Devon, and of the English sea wolves, the Spanish treasure ships began to sail upon the Spanish main. These galleons were like huge floating castles and were manned by armed Spaniards. They were filled with bars of glittering gold and silver and with other treasure of the New World. For after Columbus's discovery, there had come to the New World greedy pearl-seekers and even greedier gold-hunters and slave-traders. They exploited the mines and pearl-fisheries, and capturing thousands of helpless Indians, sold them to Spanish masters to do all kinds of hard labor. Thus, Spanish America became a vast treasure-house for the Spanish crown. Pack trains of Indian and Negro slaves and mules under guard, carrying bullion, gems, fragrant spices, and costly woods, toiled along the steep and narrow trails of the Andes, or threaded the dangerous mountain passes. These miserable slaves, groaning under their heavy burdens, cringed beneath the lashes of their driver's whips. They shivered in the piercing cold of the high mountains, and panted from tropic heat as the pack trains wound their way across the isthmus of Panama to the Atlantic side. There, the great galleons took aboard the gold, silver, emeralds, pearls, spices, and woods, as well as cargoes of slaves, then sailed away with them across the Spanish main. But gold breeds robbers, and along the coast and on the Caribbean Sea swarmed pirate ships, waiting to swoop down upon the galleons. Oftentimes, buccaneers grappled with the treasure ships, putting the Spaniards to the knife and carrying off the booty to their pirate islands. So not every galleon came safely to its Spanish port. 2. And in order that this stupendous wealth of the West Indies and of Tierra Ferme, as South America was then called, should belong to no country but herself, Spain sent out governors to rule with iron hand her Spanish-American colonies. For the Spanish crown had colonies in South America, just as England had in North America. In South America were many important cities and towns. These governors were, for the most part, gold-grasping officials. They oppressed the Creoles, as the native-born Americans of pure Spanish blood were called. And besides the Creoles, there were in Spanish America Indians, Negro slaves, and people of mixed blood, all subjects of the crown. Laws were enforced taxing the people heavily, closing their ports to foreign trade, and forbidding them to manufacture commodities which Spain herself wished to make and sell to the colonists at exorbitant prices. Not even the rich Creoles were allowed to travel abroad without permission from the crown, when in Spain they were treated with contempt. Their education was limited. Higher education is not for Americans, the creed to Spanish king, and they might not read books forbidden by Spain. And at that time, the Roman Catholic Church was exercising its power in Spanish America in much the same fashion as the established Church of England was misusing its function at the time of the Pilgrim Fathers, Roger Williams and William Penn. If any of the colonists raised their voices in protest, their property was confiscated and they were arrested. The slightest rebellion was mercilessly punished. Many of the captured rebels were either flung into filthy dungeons to die or were executed. Large numbers of Indians, Negroes, and people of mixed blood perished miserably in the mines and on the plantations, or while deep-sea diving for pearls. All this to fill the Spanish galleons with treasure. 3. Then came the liberators, facing death or cruel imprisonment, but they were strengthened by the justice of their cause and by the fact that the United States of America had succeeded in separating from her mother country and had established a republic in which the citizens, rich and poor alike, had a voice in their own government. It is the story of some of these liberators that is told here, 
the Washingtons and Lincolns of their native lands, who freed their countrymen from the curse of the Spanish treasure ships, and who established the Latin American republics. The Romance of Miranda This is the romance of Francisco de Miranda of Venezuela, the flaming son of liberty, the knight errant of freedom, who made Spain tremble. Romance was in his blood, for Avaro, his great Spanish ancestor, had won the family coat of arms by rescuing five Christian maidens from pagan moors, and Miranda's father, an adventurous, bold Spaniard, had crossed the Atlantic in those dangerous days of pirates to seek his fortune in Venezuela. So the boy, who was to make Spain tremble, was born in Venezuela and grew up in the city of Caracas. He liked to read and study. He was given a classical education, but the call of romance and adventure was too loud for him to remain quietly at home. When he was sixteen, he sailed for Spain to try his own fortune. His father was wealthy, and the boy bought a captain's commission in the regiment of the princess. He studied military science and fought valiantly against Spain's enemies. He collected books. In fact, he spent a great deal of money bringing books from many countries, only to have some of his precious volumes burned by the Spanish Inquisition, because they taught of equality, fraternity, and liberty. Then came our American War for Independence. While Washington and the Continental Army were fighting for our liberty, Miranda's romantic career as a knight errant of liberty began, for Spain and France were both at war with England. They sent troops to the West Indies to form an expedition to take away from England, Pensacola, and Florida. Miranda, a high-spirited executive young officer, was chosen to accompany the Spanish troops. So for two years he took part in our struggle for independence. But he made enemies among the Spanish officials stationed in the West Indies. They accused him of disloyalty to Spain. He was tried and banished for ten years. Probably he had aroused their suspicion because, while fighting for our freedom, he had begun to plan for the independence of Venezuela. Thus Miranda became an exile from all of Spain's dominions. Filled with his great idea of freedom for his country, he went wandering about Europe armed with papers, maps, and information about Spanish America. He went from court to court, from country to country. He even visited the United States, trying to persuade some government to take up the cause of independence for Spanish America and to lend him money, men, and arms. But he found time in the midst of all this roving to become a soldier of France and to fight for her freedom during the French Revolution. He had many thrilling adventures and was imprisoned and escaped. Then he once more took up his wanderings and petitionings. He was a handsome man, his courtly manners, charm, and eloquence, his burning words of patriotism, everywhere aroused sympathy. He told of the sufferings of his countrymen and of the great commercial opportunities which Spanish America offered to whatever friendly nation would help to gain her freedom. Everywhere he was received with attention. The Empress Catherine the Great of Russia became his friend. William Pitt gave him many assurances that England would aid him if possible, while our own Alexander Hamilton wrote him that he hoped the United States might soon come forward openly to the support of Spanish-American independence. Time and again, it seemed as though Miranda were succeeding, but on each occasion international politics interfered, and the governments withdrew their encouragement. Spain feared Miranda. She pronounced him a fugitive from justice. Her spies followed him. They searched his papers and would have seized him and carried him back to Spain had they not been afraid of his powerful friends in Russia and England. In Miranda's London home, many Spanish-American patriots met together and joined a secret society founded by him. They planned to free Spanish America, and they swore to give their lives and their all to the aid of their country. Many years passed by. Miranda was over fifty. Yet he had not struck a single blow for Venezuela. He determined to wait no longer for foreign aid. 
He believed that the time was ripe to declare the independence of Spanish America. He believed that the people there were waiting eagerly for him to raise liberty's standard against Spain. He had no funds, so he pledged his precious library, which, during so many years, he had collected with such pains, industry, and affection. Then, with the money thus raised, he sailed for the city of New York. The Mystery Ship Hail! The red, yellow, and blue! The tricolor that flew on the winds of the Spanish main, striking the heart of Spain, breaking the tyrant chain, with this message of freedom true, the red, the yellow, the blue. It was early in the year 1806. Near a wharf in Staten Island rode the good ship Leander, tugging at her anchor. A crowd of young men, some of them from New York and Long Island, came hurrying onto the wharf. Many were college men, others were working boys. Some were dressed in fashionable clothes, while others, who shouldered their way huskily through the crowd, wore plain homespun and carried kits of tools or bundles of clothes. Among these young men was William Steuben Smith, the grandson of John Adams, ex-president of the United States. With his father's permission, he had left college to sail on the Leander, but he had not consulted his grandfather. He and the other young men had signed ship's papers to sail in the Leander, yet few of them knew where they were going. It was to be a mysterious voyage. A number of the men had been told that they would get much gold, and at the same time help to free an unknown suffering people from slavery. Others had been persuaded to join the expedition by being assured that they were going south to guard the Washington Mail. Few, if any, had seen their new employer and commander, George Martin. The ship's boats filled rapidly and rolled out to the Leander. All the men were set on board. Then she weighed anchor and, with sails spread, was soon briskly cutting her way through the waves of the outer bay. And when Sandy Hook was passed, she stood out to sea. Then there appeared on deck a most romantic figure in a red robe and slippers. The word went round, It's our commander, George Martin. And George Martin, though the young men did not know it, was Francisco de Miranda. The red rope flapped in the wind around his well-built form. His gray hair, powdered and combed back from his high forehead, was tied behind with the ribbon, while from either ear stood out large, wiry, gray side whiskers. As he strolled across the deck, Examining the young man with his piercing, eager, hazel eyes, he smiled pleasantly, showing handsome white teeth. They crowded around him, hoping to hear where they were going. Some even asked the question, but he, ignoring it, shook hands with each one and conversed in a delightful manner, now asking the college men about their studies and now speaking to the others about their work. Still the mystery remained. Whither was the ship going? Day after day went by, and the mystery deepened. The Leander took her course southward. George Martin, mingling with the men, chatted affably. He related his adventures, told of his sufferings, escapes, and many perils, and of his friendships at court, and of all the romance of his life. Then he waxed warmer, and spoke of his great idea of equality, fraternity, and liberty for all men. Thus he aimed to sow seeds of heroic deeds and freedom in the minds of the young men. Meanwhile, he began to drill the men on deck, assigning officers to duties. He fixed the regimental uniforms, the infantry dress in blue and yellow, the artillery in blue and red, the engineers in blue and black velvet, the riflemen in green the dragoons in yellow and blue. From sunrise to sunset, there was hustle and bustle on deck. A printing press was set up. At an armorer's bench, a man was repairing old muskets, sharpening bayonets, and cleaning rusty swords. Tailors, sitting cross-legged on the deck, were cutting out and stitching uniforms. A body of raw recruits were drilling under a drill master who looked as bold as a lion and roared nearly as loud. 
There was buzz everywhere, and excitement too, for no one yet knew to what land the ship was going. And George Martin, looking mightily pleased, stood watching everybody and everything, and saying, We shall soon be ready for the main. Then a day arrived when several hundred proclamations were run off the printing press. They were addressed to the people of South America, painting strongly their hardships and woes, and promising them deliverance from Spain. They were signed, Don Francisco de Miranda, Commander-in-Chief of the Colombian Army. Thereupon, George Martin, who was Miranda, announced that he expected soon to land on the coast of Venezuela and strike the first blow against Spain. Some of the young Americans, who were eager to fight anywhere or anybody, and who longed for the glint of Spanish gold, cheered loudly. But their mates kept quiet, with heavy hearts, for they had begun to wonder whether, after all, they were not a band of mere filibusters instead of a noble army, since they were sailing under no protecting flag. Then, too, rumors were going the round that if any of the men were captured by the enemy, they would be given short shrift and hanged as pirates. A few days later, General Miranda hoisted for the first time the new Colombian flag of freedom, a tricolor, the red, yellow, and blue. And as it floated wide on the southern wind, a gun was fired and toast drunk to the banner that was long to wave, and is waving today over the Republic of Venezuela. It was the first flag of Spanish-American independence. After the flag raising, the Leander sped merrily on her way, carrying the raw army of about two hundred men to fight the whole of Spain, while many of them in the gloomy bottoms of their hearts were heartily wishing that they were safe at home again in the good old city of New York. Retold from accounts by James Biggs and Moses Smith of Long Island, two Americans who sailed with Miranda, 1806. The End of the Mystery Ship And what became of the young Americans who had been persuaded to ship in the Leander? Two English schooners, the Bacchus and the Bee, had joined the Leander at one of the West Indies. As the latter was overcrowded, some of the Americans were transferred to the schooners. Then, while this small fleet of three small vessels were approaching Venezuela, two Spanish revenue cutters swooped down upon them. The Leander engaged the enemy bravely, firing her guns, but the Bacchus and B tried to escape and became separated from the Leander. The revenue cutters turned and, pursuing the little ships, captured them and all on board. Our young Americans fought bravely, but they were badly wounded with knives and swords. They were captured and plundered by the Spaniards. They were stripped and tied back to back. In this humiliating condition, they were carried to the fortress of Puerto Cabello and thrown into a dungeon, where they were chained together two and two and loaded with irons. The dungeon was a living sepulchre, a mere cavity in the moss-grown, moldy fortress wall, and below ground at that. The rain soaked through the foundations, and the poor fellows lay wallowing in filth and mire. They were tried by a Spanish court and condemned. Fourteen of them were hanged as pirates. As for the rest, those who were flung back alive into their dungeon, how gladly now would they have fought to liberate the Spanish-American people! They no longer blamed Miranda, but wished to aid him with all their might. Like a spluttering candle whose flame suddenly goes out, so ended the ill-fated career of the mystery ship. Miranda landed on the coast of Venezuela. He and his men fought well, but the people did not rise up to join his standard as he had expected. Instead, they fled from him. They were afraid. Spain was too strong in Venezuela, and the patriot cause too weak. So Miranda was driven from the country. His expedition failed. He was, finally, forced to disband what was left of his little Colombian army, after which he took refuge again in England. As for the poor captive American lads, 
those who had not been hanged as pirates our united states government could do little to assist them for we were not at war with spain and the young men had been taken as pirates on the high seas some of them continued to languish in spanish dungeons others were put to hard labor in the mines and few of them were ever heard of again the great and glorious fifth meanwhile a great change was taking place in europe napoleon had forced the king of spain to abdicate in venezuela the people felt no longer bound in loyalty to the spanish crown miranda's teachings had made an impression the seeds of patriotism which he had sown were taking root the patriot party in venezuela grew strong young simon bolivar a fiery patriot was sent on a mission to england while there he sought out miranda he invited him to return to venezuela and help the patriot cause so miranda returned on the fifth of july eighteen eleven a congress representing the venezuelan people assembled and voted in the name of the all-powerful god a declaration of independence of the united provinces of venezuela which by right and act became a free sovereign and independent state miranda was one of the signers it was a great and glorious fifth like our fourth when liberty enlightened that land for it was the first declaration of independence in all spanish america and the brave delegates who put their names to it did so at the greatest risk of their lives for spain was still strong in venezuela on that same day the venezuelan congress adopted a flag for the republic the tricolor the red yellow and blue which miranda had flown from the leander miranda was made commander-in-chief of the patriot army of venezuela and led it against the spanish forces a terrible thing but the struggle against spain was only just begun her armies were large her general monteverde was treacherous crafty and cruel much of venezuela yet groaned beneath the heel of spain miranda and his soldiers fought valiantly now defeated now victorious it began to seem as though the patriot cause might triumph in the end then a terrible thing happened an earthquake frightful tremendous shook the land the earth heaved like the sea in all directions churches houses and barracks swayed and fell with a roar men women and children were crushed and killed the patriot arms and supplies were buried under mountains of debris in the city of caracas the ruins were awful the frantic people ran screaming into the great square the hearts of the bravest were frozen with terror but the earthquake had scarcely passed away but for friars who were loyal to spain were mounted on a table in the midst of the frightened multitude the earthquake is the judgment of god they cried and his curse on all who are trying to cast off their virtuous king the lord's anointed the people listened in horror a religious panic spread from caracas throughout venezuela people forgot that earthquakes had often happened before in many parts of the world casting cities into ruins they believed that god almighty had condemned their struggle for independence many soldiers of the patriot army refused to fight any more against spain they deserted in numbers to monteverde in vain miranda tried to rally his troops he could no longer persuade them to believe in the justice of their cause superstitious terror had made cowards of them all monteverde continued to advance rapidly miranda saw not only his rankings thinning daily but the country that supplied food and cattle for his army falling into the hands of the enemy then came a final crushing blow the strong fortress of puerto cabello fell into the hands of monteverde end of the romance venezuela is wounded in the heart exclaimed miranda in a deep voice as he read the dispatch telling of the loss of puerto cabello it was simon bolivar the fiery impetuous young patriot who had lost this important fortress and city to monteverde he was in despair bolivar said 
because his own body had not been left under the ruins of that city. But the fortress was irretrievably lost, and the tide of fortune was turned against independence. The cause of Venezuela seemed hopeless. Miranda was worn and weary, so he capitulated. He capitulated to Monteverde with the agreement that none of the patriots should be made to suffer for their rebellion, and that any of them who so wished might leave the country. After signing the capitulation, Miranda prepared to leave on an English vessel and seek refuge in the West Indies. He sent his servants with his money and precious papers aboard. He then decided to sleep that night on land and embark the next morning. But he never embarked. Bolivar, with some of Miranda's officers, indignant, it is said, because Miranda had capitulated, seized him while he was asleep and threw him into a dungeon after which they surrendered him to Monteverde, who had him transferred in chains to Puerto Cabello, the same fortress in which our young Americans from the mystery ship had suffered so terribly. Meanwhile, Simon Bolivar obtained a passport from Monteverde and fled to the West Indies. As for Miranda, he continued to languish in Spanish-American prisons for some time. Then he was carried to Spain and cast into a dungeon. Though Miranda's existence was miserable, he received comfort from his books, for he delighted to read. In his cell, after his death, were found Horace, Virgil, Cicero, Don Quixote, and even a copy of the New Testament. Early on the morning of July 14, 1816, he gave his soul to God, his name to history, and his body to the earth. Whether he died by poison, execution or natural death no one knows thus perished the flaming son of liberty the knight errant of freedom the chief of the apostles of spanish american independence so his romance was ended but his work was only begun it lived on for others to finish for how his work lived on read simon bolivar the liberator page 371 End of chapter 19. Recording by Natasha Fisher at a fish in the sea dot me. Chapter 20 of Good Stories for Great Birthdays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Good Stories for Great Birthdays by Francis Jenkins Alcott, recorded by Janice Hopkins. June 23rd, 24. Roger Williams and the Founding of Providence. He has been rightly called the first American because he was the first to actualize in a commonwealth the distinctively American principle of freedom for mind, body, and soul. Arthur B. Strickland. God makes a path. God makes a path, provides a guide, and feeds in wilderness. His glorious name, while breath remains, oh, that I may confess. Lost many a time, I have had no guide, no house but hollow tree. In stormy winter night, no fire, no food, no company. In him, I found a house, a bed, a table, company. No cup so bitter, but made sweet. When God shall sweetening be. Roger Williams. The date of Roger Williams' birth is unknown, probably about 1604 or 1607. He founded Providence about June 23, 24, 1636. He died 1684. He has been called the Apostle of Soul Liberty. Roger the Boy. The exact date of Roger Williams' birth is unknown nor are his historians agreed on the place where he was born. It is generally thought that he was born in London, where his father was a tailor. He is also said to have been distantly related to Oliver Cromwell. When Roger Williams was a boy, a new system of writing had been devised, called shorthand. He learned it, and going to the Star Chamber, took down some of the sermons and speeches. The judge, Sir Edward Coke, was so pleased with his work, that he became Roger Williams' friend and patron, and even gained him admission to one of the famous English schools. 
Later, young Roger Williams attended Cambridge University. After leaving Cambridge, he is said to have studied law under his friend Sir Edward Coke. Then, not being satisfied with law, he studied to become a minister. Like William Penn, Roger Williams was a thoughtful boy, and like William Penn, he had a sweet experience in childhood. For Roger Williams himself, when old, said, From my childhood, now about threescore years, the Father of lights and mercies touched my soul, with the love for himself, to his only begotten, the true Lord Jesus, and to his holy scriptures. Soul Liberty In those days in England, many members of the established church believed that church needed reforming or purifying. These members were called Puritans. They were severely persecuted. A number of them emigrated from England to Massachusetts Bay. One body of these colonists settled in Salem, and another founded Charleston and Boston. About a year after the settlement of Boston, a young man came thither from England. He, too, had left home because of religious persecution. He was known to be a godly man and thought to be a Puritan. He was warmly welcomed by the Boston folk. He was Roger Williams. But soon the good folk of Boston were scandalized. The Puritans of Boston had not actually separated from the established church as had their neighbors, the separatists of Plymouth. They had merely purified their mode of worship. They had, moreover, decreed that the government of their colony should be directed by their church. They did not permit any man not in good church standing to have a vote in public affairs. They even persecuted folk who did not believe as they did, and who would not attend their church. Roger Williams soon electrified them by urging not only separation from the established church, but asserting that no government had a right to interfere with the religious faith of anyone. The place of the government, he said, was to prevent crime, not to enforce any form of religion. Every man had the right to soul liberty, he asserted. He also insisted that the King of England had no right whatsoever to give away the lands belonging to Indians without their consent. The Puritans bitterly opposed him. After a few years, since he continued to preach and teach his beliefs, they tried him in their court and banished him from the colony. In the middle of a New England winter, he was forced to leave his wife, child, and many sorrowing friends, and flee through the snow to safety. He had with him to direct his way only a sundial and a compass. His sufferings were terrible. He never got over the effects of the cold and hunger which he endured on that flight through the wilderness. He had made friends among the Indians with the Massasoit and the Canonicus. He had most lovingly carried the gospel to them and their peoples. He had passed many a night with them in their lodges, and now that he was in want and distress, it was his Indian friends who secured him. In the spring, he had begun to build and plant at Seekonk, when Governor Winslow of Plymouth, in the kindest of spirits, sent him word that Seekonk was within the bounds of the Plymouth colony, and in order that there might be no trouble with the Massachusetts Bay colony, he advised him to move across the water, where he would be as free as the Plymouth folk themselves adding that Roger Williams and the Plymouth folk might be loving neighbors together. What cheer Providence founded 1636. Without bitterness or complaint, Roger Williams prepared immediately to abandon the cabin he had built at Seekonk and the fields which he had so industriously sown and cultivated. With five companions who had joined him there, he entered his canoe and dropped down the river watching the bank for an inviting landing. On approaching a little cove, friendly voices saluted him. On Slate Rock, Indians were waiting to welcome him. What cheer! Ne top! they exclaimed. It was a salutation, meaning, how do you do, friend? Roger Williams and his companions landed, but were more pleased with the welcome than the place. Getting into their canoe again, they rounded Indian Point and Fox Point and sailed up a beautiful sheet of water skirting a dense forest to a spot near the mouth of the Mushasik River. A spring of fresh water was no doubt one of its attractions. 
Here, Roger Williams commenced to build again and to prepare for future planting. He gave the place the name of Providence, in grateful remembrance of God's merciful providence to me in my distress. Risking his life, no one can say that Roger Williams was not a good Christian, a better one than those who drove him from his home, for he soon risked his own life to save them from danger. The fierce and warlike Indians of the Pequot tribe had made an attack on the settlers and were trying to get the large and powerful tribe of the Narragansetts to join them. They wished to kill all the white people of the Plymouth colony and drive the pale faces from the country. The people of Plymouth and of Boston, too, were in a great fright when they heard of this. They knew that Roger Williams was the only white man in the region who had any influence with the Indians, and they sent to him, begging him to go to the Narragansett camp and ask the Narragansetts not to join the Pequots. Many men would have refused to go into a horde of raging savages to procure the safety of their enemies, but Roger Williams was too noble to refuse. Though he knew that his life would be in the utmost danger, for some of the bloodthirsty Pequots were then with the Narragansetts. He promptly went to the Indian camp and spent three days in the wigwams of the Sachem. Though he expected every night to have the treacherous Pequots put their bloody knives to his throat. But the Narragansetts were strong friends with the honest pastor. They listened to his counsel, and in the end, they and another tribe, the Mohicans, joined the English against the Pequots. Thus it was chiefly due to Roger Williams that the colonists were saved from the scalping knives of the Indians. Years of peace and prosperity existed in Providence plantations. The colony grew. No man interfered with another man's religion. Those in the other New England colonies who did not want to be forced to accept the creed of the Puritans came to the colony of Roger Williams. He was their principal pastor. He was so kind, gentle, and good that everybody respected and loved him. His people were his children. He had brought them together and spent his time working for their good, and they looked on him as their best friend. End of chapter. Chapter 21 of Good Stories for Great Birthdays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Good Stories for Great Birthdays by Francis Jenkins Alcott. Recording by Janice Hopkins. July 6. John Paul Jones. America's Immortal Sea Fighter. I have not yet begun to fight. Paul Jones A song unto liberty's brave buccaneer. Ever bright be the fame of the patriot rover. For our rights he first fought in his black privateer, And faced the proud foe ere our sea they crossed over. In their channel and coast he scattered their host. T'was his hand that raised, the first flag that blazed, and his deeds neath the pine tree, all ocean amazed. John Paul was born in Scotland July 6, 1747. Was the first American naval officer to receive a foreign salute for the Stars and Stripes, 1778. Won the victory over the Serapis, 1779. He died in Paris, July 18, 1792. His body brought to America in 1905 and interred with honors at the U.S. Naval Academy, Annapolis. The Boy of the Solway Born by the seashore of Scotland, where the tide heaves up the Solway, living on a promontory surrounded by romantic scenery, and with the words of seafaring men constantly ringing in his ears, the boy, John Paul, longed to be a sailor. He was the son of a poor gardener, but he was of that poetic, romantic temperament, which always builds gorgeous structures in the future, and no boy with a fancy like that of Paul could be content to live the humdrum life of a gardener's son. So he launched forth with a strong arm and resolute spirit to who is way among his fellows. 
John Paul was only 12 or 14 years of age when he became a sailor on board a ship bound to Virginia. Thus early were his footsteps directed to America, by which his whole future career was shaped. After reaching America, he took the name of Jones. He rendered his new name immortal, and the real name John Paul is sunk in that of Paul Jones. Don't tread on me. In 1775, when our war for independence broke out, Paul Jones commenced his brilliant career. Some men regard him as sort of a freebooter turned patriot, an adventurer to whom the American war was a godsend, and in that it kept him from being a pirate, but nothing could be further from the truth. When the war broke out, he offered to serve the Navy. Congress accepted his offer and appointed him first lieutenant in the Alfred. As the commander-in-chief of the squadron came on board the Alfred, Paul Jones unfurled our national flag, the first time its folds were ever given to the breeze. What that flag was, strange as it may seem, no record tells us. It was not the Stars and Stripes, for they were not adopted till two years after. The generally received opinion is that it was a pine tree with a rattlesnake coiled at the roots, as if about to spring and underneath the motto, Don't Tread on Me. If the flag bore such a symbol, it was most appropriate to Paul Jones, for no serpent was ever more ready to strike than he. At all events, it unrolled to the breeze and waved over as a gallant a young officer ever trod a quarter deck. Fairly afloat, 29 years of age, healthy, well-knit, though of light and slender frame, a commissioned officer in the American Navy, the young gardener, saw with joy the shores receding as the fleet steered for the Bahama Isles. The result of this expedition was the capture of New Providence, with a hundred cannon and abundance of military stores, and the capture was brought about by the perseverance and daring of young Paul Jones. The First Salute The Flag and I are twins, born at the same hour, we cannot be parted in life or death. So long as we shall float, we shall float together. If we sink, we shall go down as one. Paul Jones, June 14, 1777, was a great day for the United States and for Paul Jones. On that self same day, Congress passed two famous resolutions, and Commander Paul Jones and the flag of the nation were born at the same hour. Resolved that the flag of the 13 United States be 13 stripes, alternate red and white, that the Union be 13 stars, white and a blue field, representing a new constellation. Resolved that Captain John Paul Jones be appointed to command the ship Ranger. Thus it came to pass that the gallant young Scotchman, eager to fight for liberty, hastened to make the Ranger ready for sea. Then he sailed away under orders for France. From the harbor of Nantes, he convoyed some American ships to place them under the protection of the French fleet in Cuberian Bay. The commander of the French fleet was Admiral Limotte Piquet, who had been ordered by his government to keep the coast of France free from British cruisers. And it was there in Cuberian Bay that John Paul Jones received the first salute ever given by a foreign nation to our stars and stripes a salute that recognized the independence of the United States. It was on Washington's birthday, 1778, that Paul Jones wrote to our government describing this great event. I am happy in having it in my power to congratulate you, he said, on my having seen the American flag for the first time recognized in the fullest and completest manner by the flag of France. It was off of their bay, the 18th, and sent my boat in the next day, to know if the admiral would return my salute. He answered that he would return to me, as the senior American continental officer in Europe, the same salute which he was authorized by his court to return to an admiral of Holland, or of any other republic, which was four guns less than the salute given. I hesitated at this, for I had demanded gun for gun. Therefore, I anchored in the entrance of the bay, at a distance from the French fleet, 
but after a very particular inquiry, on the 14th, finding that he had really told the truth, I was induced to accept of his offer, the more so as it was in fact an acknowledgement of American independence. The wind being contrary and blowing hard, it was after sunset before the ranger got near enough to salute La Motte Paquette with thirteen guns, which he returned with nine. However, to put the matter beyond a doubt, I did not suffer the independence to salute till next morning, when I sent the admiral word that I should sail through its fleet in the brig and would salute him in open day. He was exceedingly pleased and returned the compliment also with nine guns. Paul Jones thus had the singular honor of being the first to hoist the original flag of liberty on board the Alfred, first to probably hoist the stars and stripes, which still wave in pride as our national emblem, and first to claim for our flag the courtesy from foreigners due to a sovereign state. The poor Richard, Paul Jones gave up the command of the ranger in order to take command of a larger ship, promised him by the French government, but he had a long discouraging period of waiting for the new ship. It was then that he wrote to a French official those famous words, I will not have anything to do with ships which do not sail fast, for I intend to go in harm's way. After months of desperate waiting and after writing many letters, Paul Jones chanced to be reading a copy of Franklin's Poor Richard's Almanac. These words caught his eye. If you would have your business done, go. If not, send. So he stopped sending letters and hastened to Paris to plead his own calls. With the help of Franklin himself, Paul Jones got his ship at last. He named it Bonhomme Richard, or the Poor Richard. It was while commanding the Poor Richard that Paul Jones gained his famous victory over the British ship, the Serapis. Mickles the mischief he has done. With seven ships in all, a snug little squadron for Jones. Had the different commanders been subordinate, he set sail in the Richard from France and steered for the coast of Ireland. The want of proper subordination was soon made manifest, for in a week's time the vessels, one after another, parted company to cruise by themselves till Paul Jones had with him but the alliance, palace, and vengeance. In a tremendous storm he bore away, and after several days of gales and heavy seas, approached the shore of Scotland. Taking several prizes near the Firth of Forth, he ascertained that a twenty-four-gun ship and two cutters were in the roads. This he determined to cut out, and, landing in life, lay the town under contribution. The inhabitants supposed his little fleet to be English vessels in pursuit of Paul Jones, and a member of Parliament, a wealthy man in the place, sent off a boat requesting powder and balls to defend himself, as he said against the pirate Paul Jones. Jones very politely sent back the bearer with a barrel of powder, expressing his regrets that he had no shot to spare. Soon after this, he summoned the town to surrender, but the wind blowing steadily off the land, he could not approach with his vessel. At length, however, the wind changed and the Richard stood boldly in for the shore. The inhabitants, as they saw her bearing steadily up toward the place, were filled with terror and ran hither and thither in a fright. But the good minister, Reverend Mr. Shira, assembled his flock on the beach to pray the Lord to deliver them from their enemies. He was an eccentric man, one of the quaintest of the quaint old Scott divines so that his prayers, even in those days, were often quoted for their oddity and roughness. Having gathered his congregation on the beach in full sight of the vessel, which under a press of canvas was making a long track that brought her close to the town, he knelt down on the sand and thus began. Now, dear Lord, didn't you think it a shame for you to send this vile pirate to rub our folk o' Kirkaldy? For ye can their poor and now already and had nothing to spare. The while the wind blows, he'll be here in a jiffy. And what cans what he may do? He's not too good for anything. 
Mickle's the mischief he's doing already. He'll burn their houses, take the very claws, and turn them to the sock. And was me. Well, Ken's but the bloody villain may take their very lives. The poor wee men are most frightened out of their wits, and the burn skilling after them. I cannot think of it. I cannot think of it. I have been a long faithful servant to ye, Lord. Virginia, dinner, turn the wind about and blow the scandal out our gate. I'll not stir a foot, but we'll just sit there till the toy comes, to so take your will out. Now, to the no little astonishment of the good people, a fierce gale at the moment began to blow, which sent one of Jones's prizes ashore and forced him to stand out to sea. This fixed forever the reputation of good Mr. Shira, and he did not himself wholly deny that he believed his intercessions brought on the gale. For whenever his parishioners spoke of it to him, he always replied, I prayed, but the Lord sent the wind. Paul Jones himself. Paul Jones was slight, being only five feet and a half high. A stoop in his shoulders diminished still more his stature. But he was firmly knit and capable of enduring a great fatigue. He had dark eyes and a thoughtful, pensive look when not engaged in conversation but his countenance lighted up in moments of excitement, and in a battle became terribly determined. His lips closed like a vice, while his brow contracted with the rigidity of iron. The tones of his voice were then haughty in the extreme, and his words had an emphasis in them, which those who heard never forgot. He seemed unconscious of fear, and moved amid the storm of battle and trod the deck of his shattered and wrecked vessel, like one who rules his own destiny. He would cruise without fear in a single sloop, right before the harbors of England, and sail amid ships double his size of his own. But with all his fierceness in the hour of battle, he had as kind a heart as ever beat. To see him in a hot engagement, covered with the smoke of cannon, himself working the guns, while the timbers around him were constantly ripping with the enemy's shot, or watch him on the deck of his dismasted vessel, over which the hurricane swept and the sea rolled. One would think him destitute of emotion, but his reports of the scenes afterwards resembled the descriptions of an excited spectator. He was an old Roman soldier in danger, but a poet in his after accounts of it. Jones had great defects of character, but most of them sprang from his want of early education. He was not a mere adventurer, owning his elevation to headlong daring. He was a hard student as well as a hard fighter, and had a strong intellect as well as a strong arm. He wrote with astonishing fluency considering the neglect of his early education. He even wrote eloquently at times, and always with force. His verses were as good as the general run of poetry of that kind. Paul Jones was an irregular character, but his good qualities predominated over his bad ones. And as the man who first hoisted the American flag at sea, and received the first salute ever offered it by a foreign nation, and the first who carried it victoriously through the fight on the waves, he deserves our highest praise and most grateful remembrance. With such a commander to lead the American Navy and stand before it as the model of a brave man, no wonder our Navy has covered itself with glory. Some of his sayings, I will not have anything to do with ships which do not sail fast, for I intend to go in harm's way. Don't swear, Mr. Stacy, we may at the next moment be in eternity, but let us do our duty. I have not yet begun to fight. I have ever looked out for the honor of the American flag. I can never renounce the glorious title of a citizen of the United States. I can accept of no honor that will call in question my devotion to America. End of chapter 21「Chapter twenty two of Good Stories for Great Birthdays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.
Good Stories for Great Birthdays by Francis Jenkins Olcott July 24th, Simon Bolivar of Venezuela, The Liberator Colombians, all your beauteous fatherland is now free. From the banks of the Orinoco River to the Peruvian Andes, the Army of Liberation, marching triumphantly, has covered all the territory of Colombia with its protecting arms. Colombians of the South, the blood of your brothers has redeemed you from the horrors of war. Bolivar. Bolivar. Build up a column to Bolivar. Build it under a tropic star. Build it high as his mounting fame. Crown its head with his noble name. Let the letters tell like a light afar. This is the column of Bolivar. Raise the column to Bolivar, firm in peace and fierce in war. Shout forth his noble, noble name. Shout till his enemies die in shame. Shout till Colombia's woods awaken, like seas by a mighty tempest shaken. Till pity and praise and great disdain sound like an Indian hurricane. Shout as you shout in conquering war, while you build the column to Bolivar. Barry Cornwall condensed. Bolivar was born in Venezuela, July 24, 1783. Formed the Republic of Great Colombia, 1819. He died in exile, December 17, 1830. His full name was Simon José Antonio de la Santísima Trinidad de Bolivar y Palacios, but he was known as the citizen Simon Bolivar. Bolivar's name is pronounced Simon Bolivar. The old-fashioned English way was to pronounce it Boyevar, as in the poem above. The Precious Jewel Two boys were playing a royal game of tennis in the royal tennis court at Madrid in Spain. The rich American boy, Simón de Bolivar, from Venezuela, was serving swift ball after swift ball to Ferdinand, prince of the Asturias, and heir to the Spanish throne. The queen mother was looking on. The prince saw that he was losing and grew angry. Bolivar, small, alert, with dark eyes flashing, played on, still winning, until the prince refused to play any longer. But the queen mother sternly bade her son finish the game. So the prince had to play on, and he lost. Some day, exclaimed Bolivar in triumph, I will deprive Prince Ferdinand of the most precious jewel in his crown. Years before this tennis game, a great thing had happened in Venezuela. On July 24, 1783, a baby boy was born to a rich, noble citizen of the city of Caracas, a baby destined to deprive Prince Ferdinand of the most precious jewel in his crown. He was christened Simon José Antonio de la Santísima Trinidad de Bolivar, and, with his mother's name added as they do in Spanish America, E. Palacios, a long name for a baby. Little Bolivar had everything money could buy and slaves to wait upon him whenever he called. Before he was ten years old, his father and mother died, and he was left heir to several large fortunes. He owned many hundreds of slaves and a rich plantation called San Mateo. He was a restless, adventurous, self-willed boy, small but very alert and bright. He did not like to study much, but he was always ready to sit and listen to his tutor, Rodriguez, whom he adored. His black eyes sparkled as his tutor told him of lands where people governed themselves. Sometimes, Rodriguez explained the meaning of equality, fraternity, and liberty. And the little boy began to dream of liberty and independence for his own Venezuela. But Bolivar did not spend all his time dreaming. He was far too passionately fond of outdoor sports for that. He fished, swam, and learned to shoot. He joined the white militia of the valleys of Aragua. When he was 16, his guardian sent him to Spain. There he went to school and lived with his uncle, who was a favorite at court. And there he beat the sulky Prince Ferdinand at tennis. And there he met and loved a noble little Spanish maid, Maria del Toro, just 15 years old. So Bolivar forgot for a while his threat to deprive Prince Ferdinand of his most precious jewel. Bolivar and Maria were married and went on their honeymoon to Venezuela. They reached the lovely plantation of San Mateo, where they lived and were very happy. But alas, in a few months, the girl bride sickened and died of a fever. Then the passionate heart of young Bolivar almost broke. 
he vowed in his grief never to marry again. Soon after Maria's death, he went back to Europe to try to forget his sorrow in travel and study. In France, he endeavored to drown his sad memories in gay living, but he could not forget Maria. Then he met Rodriguez, his old tutor, who had been banished from Venezuela. This Rodriguez was a strange, rough fellow with many wild ideas and some good ones too. From childhood, Bolivar had confided all his sorrows and joys to him. And now, as a young man, he was led by his advice. Rodriguez saw that Bolivar was wasted and consumptive. He persuaded him to go on a walking trip. Knapsack on shoulder, the two set off for their tramp. In Milan, they saw Napoleon crowned king of Italy. They visited many historical spots to which Rodriguez took Bolivar on purpose to arouse again his eager interest in equality, fraternity, and liberty. Together they climbed Mount Sacro in Rome, and there Bolivar remembered his threat to deprive Prince Ferdinand of the most precious jewel in his crown. He seized Rodriguez's hand and swore a solemn oath to wrest Venezuela from the crown of Spain. For Venezuela, in fact all Spanish America, was the vast treasure house of Spain, the most precious jewel in her crown. The Fiery Young Patriot Young Bolivar returned to his estates in Venezuela, but he stayed there only for a little while. He soon gave up the easy, indulgent life of wealth to serve the patriot cause. He was sent on a mission to England. In London, he met Miranda, the flaming son of liberty, whose burning, persuasive words blew into a flame the sparks of liberty which Rodriguez had kindled in Bolivar's bosom. Bolivar joined Miranda's secret society. He urged Miranda to return at once to Venezuela and strengthen the patriot cause. And thus it came about that the flaming son of liberty went back to his native land and was made commander-in-chief of the Venezuelan forces. Then it was that the struggle for Venezuela's independence began to make Spain tremble for the most precious jewel in her crown. How the fiery young Bolivar betrayed General Miranda has already been told in the End of the Romance, on page 344, after which Bolivar fled into exile and Spain confiscated his estates. But Bolivar never gave up his determination to free Venezuela, and when opportunity offered, he returned and became the head of the Patriot Army. It is not possible here to tell of all which he and his valiant troops accomplished. They fought against the Spanish forces, they suffered defeats, and they won victories, English, Irish, Scotch and American men were volunteers in Bolivar's army, and many of them, fighting bravely, shed their blood for Venezuela's freedom. It was a terrific war. Nowhere else in all Spanish America was there waged a more ferocious campaign. The wake of the Spanish generals, Monteverde and Boves, was strewn with the corpses of innocent non-combatants and with the ruins of pillaged towns and burned villages. It is war to the death, exclaimed Bolivar fiercely, in answer to these atrocities. And war to the death it was, on both sides. A war of ruthless retaliation on prisoners and neutrals. So the struggle went on. All the sufferings that accompany warfare were the portion of the miserable people. Ruined homes, weeping wives and mothers, sick and dying children, crippled men, starvation, disease and sorrow-stricken hearts. Seeing Bolivar High adventure and spicy dangers were awaiting the first corps of hot-headed young Englishmen who volunteered to fight for Venezuela. They shipped from England, and after thrilling escapes on the coast of Spanish Florida and among the West Indies, after many feasts of venison, wild turkey, turtle, parrots, tree oysters, and lizard, they reached Venezuela. There, higher adventures and spicier dangers were waiting. They were convoyed by brig and launches up the swift river Orinoco. They were marched through tropic forests and across llanos, or plains, to join Bolivar. As their boats were rowed through the deep water or poled through the shallows of the Orinoco, they saw most wonderful sights lining the banks the giant mangrove trees shooting their gnarled banyan-like roots into the water were linked together by living chains of vines festooned with brilliant flowers as big as saucers or tea plates 
Herds of red monkeys, with little ones clinking to their shoulders, chattered, howled, and leaped from tree to tree, following the boats along. Pink flamingos, gigantic cranes, pelicans, and spoonbills were wading about, fishing. Overhead, flocks of red, blue, green, and yellow parrots and macaws flashed to and fro, filling the air with screams, while the metallic note of the bellbird sounded now close to the air and now far away. From island to island in the river glided evil-looking light green snakes, lifting their heads and parted their bodies out of the water. And under the roots of trees and in the stream basked man-eating alligators watching for their prey, only their eyes and nostrils showing above the water. And waiting to drop upon the young Englishmen if their boats came too near were venomous snakes glittering like jewels coiled on the mangrove limbs or hanging from the branches like shining tinsel ribbons. Mosquitoes, too, were lively, piercing through the young men's blankets and cloaks. So thirsty were the insects for a taste of fresh red English blood. And the young men were forced to keep a careful lookout at night for fear of a visit from a python, jaguar, alligator, or electric eel. When the sun set, Night instantly fell like a black curtain, for there is no twilight in the tropics. Then the howling of wild beasts made the place hideous. Finally, after passing Indian villages and towns, pillaged and burned by the Spanish soldiers, after water trip and march, the young Englishman caught up with Bolivar on a plain near the Apure River. The young man had long been eager to see that remarkable general whose extraordinary energy and perseverance had already liberated a large portion of Venezuela. And it was a picturesque scene that now burst on their sight, a band of tropic warriors in a tropic setting. Bolivar was surrounded by his officers, many of them mounted, a magnificent, wild-looking band they were in shirts of brilliant colors worn over white drawers which reached below the knee. Bright bandanas were tied about their heads to keep off the sun. Over these handkerchiefs were set wide sombreros, or hats, made of split palm leaves, decorated with plumes of variegated feathers. One of the officers wore a silver helmet instead of a sombrero, and another had on a cask of beaten gold. Some had silver scabbards and heavy silver ornaments on their bridles. Almost all wore huge silver or brass spurs fastened to their bare feet. As soon as they saw the young Englishmen approaching, these wild-looking chiefs spurred their horses forward, uttering shrill shouts of welcome. They embraced the young men, like long-absent friends, and examined their weapons and uniforms. Bolivar, reining in his horse, stood looking on in silence. He was a small man, with a thin and careworn face, which had upon it an expression of patient endurance. He appeared refined and elegant, although simply dressed. He wore a dragoon's helmet. His uniform was a blue jacket with red cuffs and gilt sugarloaf buttons, coarse blue trousers, and sandals of split aloe fiber. As the young man came up, he returned their salute with a peculiar melancholy smile, and then rode on. He carried in his hand a lance from which fluttered a small black banner, embroidered with a white skull and crossbones, and the motto, Death or Liberty. When they halted for the night, the young men were presented to Bolivar as he sat in his hammock under the trees. He expressed great joy at seeing Englishmen in his army, who might train and discipline his troops. After asking questions about the condition of affairs in Europe, he dismissed them in the charge of his officers. These gave the young men lances and fine horses. Thus, the English lads became a part of Bolivar's army. They and their countrymen, forming the English Legion, performed such brave deeds and made such gallant charges on the battlefields that without them, Bolivar could not so soon have won Venezuela's independence, retold from the account by one of the young Englishmen. Uncle Paez, the Lion of the Apure Paez was one of Bolivar's most daring and picturesque generals. It would take a whole book to tell of his romantic adventures and how he was exiled and came to live in New York. There is a painting of him and his dashing cowboys in the municipal building of the city of New York. At first, he was a llanero, or cowboy of the plains. He was of mighty strength and was a magnificent horseman. He knew well how to use the llanero's lance with all its cunning tricks. 
His men were cowboys, horsemen, and fighters by instinct. They followed him into battle with wild Yanero shouts. Uncle Paez, they called him. When Bolivar, with his troops, reached the Apure River, he could not cross, for there were no boats. A few canoes were drawn up on the opposite bank, guarded by six enemy gunboats. As Bolivar paced up and down impatiently, he exclaimed, Have I no brave man near me who can take those gunboats? They shall be yours in an hour, said Paez coolly, who was standing by. Impossible, said Bolivar. Leave that to me, said Paez, and off he galloped. He soon returned with a body of cowboys picked for their bravery. To the water, lads, he cried, which is what he always said when they went swimming. The men immediately unsaddled their horses, stripped themselves to their drawers, hung their swords about their necks, and stood ready. Let those follow uncle, who please, cried Paez, and urged his horse into the river. The men rode in after him straight toward the gunboats. When the Spanish saw the dreaded cowboys approaching, who never gave quarter, they fired hurriedly and missed. Then seized with panic, some cast themselves into the water, and others escaped in canoes. Only one prisoner was taken, a woman who fired the last gun at the cowboys, but who could not stop them from boarding the gunboats. Thus Bolivar gained possession of the region on both sides of the Apure. Paez is sometimes called the Lion of the Apure. Angostura, February 15, 1819 down the upper Orinoco River, Bolivar's canoe was slipping quietly past wide savannas, palm-tufted isles, and overhanging trees. While reclining in the boat, he dictated to his secretary. During the heat of the day, they both landed, and Bolivar, lolling in a hammock under the shadow of the giant trees, one hand playing with the lapel of his coat and a forefinger on his upper lip, kept on dictating as the mood seized him. He was composing a new constitution for the Republic of Venezuela, which was to be presented at the Congress meeting in the city of Angostura on the Orinoco. And it was the adoption of this constitution that made Angostura famous. Today, the town is called the City of Bolivar. And while the Congress was meeting, Bolivar and his chief officers held a council of war, sitting on the bleached skulls of cattle slaughtered for army food. They discussed the dangerous plan of crossing the Andes into New Granada and of helping the patriots there to drive out the Spanish army. They decided to attempt the crossing. And what that terrible march was like, one of the young Englishmen who went with Bolivar will tell in our next story. The Crossing This crossing of the Andes was terrible. The hardships which Bolivar's troops endured are indescribable. At that time of year, the plains were flooded. The infantry were obliged to march for hours together up to their middle in water. Sometimes the men fell into holes or stuck fast in the marshes. Many of the soldiers were bitten in their legs and thighs by little goldfish, brilliant orange in color and exceedingly voracious. Whole swarms of these little fish came rushing through the water with their mouths open, showing their broad, sharp teeth like shark's teeth. Wherever they bit, they tore away a piece of flesh. They attacked the poor men most savagely. As the troops approached the mountains, the cold winds began to be felt blowing down from the snowy ridges or the cordilleras. Soon, violent mountain torrents swept across the army's path, and the men on horseback were forced to carry across stream all the arms and baggage of the foot soldiers. Even Bolivar himself rode again and again through the rushing current, carrying over sick and weak soldiers, and even women who had followed their husbands. As the trail began to ascend, the horses used to the level plain could scarcely keep their footing on the rocky way, and began to flag and fall lame. The snowy peaks of the Andes were now seen to stretch like an impassable barrier between Venezuela and New Granada. The narrow paths wound their way up among wild crags and through ancient forests that clothed the mountainsides with trees so vast and thick that the light of day was almost excluded. At that high altitude, the trees caught and held the passing clouds in their branches. From the clouds distilled an almost incessant rain, making the steep trails slippery and dangerous. The few tired mules that had not perished on the line of march patiently clambered on now and then one would slip and go plunging over a precipice its fall could be traced by the crashing of shrubs and trees until its mangled body rolled into a foaming stream far below 
although the army was drenched by rain night and day it did not experience severe cold until it emerged from the forest into the bleak unsheltered passes between the mountain peaks then the piercing cold bit through the soldiers thin garments many who had worn shoes when they left the plains were now barefooted even some of the officers were in rags so that they were glad to wrap themselves in blankets the view of the andes at this great height was wildly magnificent incessant gusts of wind swept the passes and whirled the snow in drifts from the summits of the ridges the whole range appeared to be encrusted with ice cracked in many places from which cascades of water were constantly rushing huge pinnacles of granite overhung the passes apparently tottering and about to fall there was no longer any beaten path the ground was rocky and broken terrific chasms yawned on every hand appalling to the sight a sense of great loneliness seized the men dead silence prevailed except for the scream of the condor or the noise of distant waterfalls the air was so rarefied that many of the soldiers overcome by drowsiness lay down and died but at last the crest of the andes was passed and the army began to descend on the other side into the valleys of new granada the descent was not so difficult because the mountain side was less rugged than the side they had ascended as soon as the army reached the lowlands bolivar lost no time in preparing for battle with his men he took his stand at the bridge of boyaca never was there a more complete victory the whole of the spanish army with baggage powder and military stores fell into the hands of bolivar the battle of boyaca liberated new granada from spain forever then venezuela and new granada united and became the republic of colombia or great colombia retold from the account of the soldier who accompanied bolivar peru next now was bolivar at the height of his power he had liberated venezuela and new granada he had founded the great republic of colombia and had given it a constitution he was practically dictator of the republic he had sent his favorite general the heroic antonio de sucre to liberate quito bolivar now turned his eyes toward peru in his ambition he dreamed of a greater colombia which should include that country but there was an obstacle in his way peru had already declared her independence the foundations of her liberty had been laid by another general and another army for jose de san martin of argentina was peru's acknowledged protector then came the amazing meeting as told on page two hundred and seventy two after that meeting bolivar with his army entered peru he combined his forces with those of the liberating army of peru and with the aid of the valiant sucre completed what san martin had so well begun and swept away the last vestiges of spanish power from south america so the great struggle for independence which had lasted over twenty years was finished but bolivar was not allowed to enjoy long the fruits of his victories we shall see why the break exiled from venezuela consumptive well-nigh penniless insulted by his own people was bolivar only a few years later the creation of his genius the great colombia was rent with revolutions his own general paez had abandoned him his friend antonio sucre had been assassinated bitterness filled bolivar's soul his pride was broken but he still loved colombia his dying words to her people were colombians my last wishes are for the happiness of my native land if my death helps to check the growth of factions and to consolidate the union i shall rest tranquilly in the tomb so passed away the liberator of venezuela the founder of the republic of colombia twelve years later paez who was ruling in venezuela brought bolivar's body to caracas and interred it with honors but he left the hero's heart in an urn in the cathedral of santa marta the city where he had died great colombia or the great republic of colombia founded by bolivar was a union consisting of venezuela new granada and ecuador great colombia fell its union was dissolved today instead there exist three independent republics venezuela colombia and ecuador as for bolivia it was a part of upper peru it was liberated by the help of antonio sucre it declared its independence and took the name of bolivar today it is the republic of bolivia rich in all the natural products of the world bolivar the man one simon de bolivar was about five feet six inches in height lean of limb and body his cheekbones stood out prominently in an oval-shaped face which tapered sharply towards the chin 
His countenance was vivacious, but his skin was furrowed with wrinkles and tanned by exposure to a tropical sun. The curly black hair that once covered Bolivar's head in luxuriant profusion began to turn white about 1821. Thenceforth, he was accustomed to wear his hair short. His nose was long and aquiline. Flexible, sensual lips were often shaded by a thick mustache, while whiskers covered a part of his face. In 1822, Bolivar's large, black, penetrating eyes, with the glance of an eagle, were losing their remarkable brilliancy. At that time, Bolivar had also lost some of the animation, energy, and extraordinary agility which had distinguished him in youth and early manhood. Even the casual observer judged him to be many years older than he really was, so sick and weary did he appear. A man of many moods, jovial, talkative, taciturn, gloomy. He changed swiftly from sunshine to storm. William Spence Robertson, Condensed. 2. Simon de Bolivar has been characterized as the Napoleon of the South American Revolution, writes William Spence Robertson, who has been decorated with Bolivar's Order of the Liberators. Defeat left Bolivar undismayed, said O'Leary, who served for a time as an aide-de-camp of the Liberator always great he was greatest in adversity his enemies had a saying that when vanquished bolivar is more terrible than when he conquers there is one point on which all are agreed writes f lorraine peter the generosity of bolivar his carelessness of money and his financial uprightness few men ever had greater opportunities of enriching themselves still fewer more honestly refused to take advantage of their opportunities he commenced life as a rich man, he died almost a pauper. The figure of the worn-out liberator, suffering in mind and body, deserted by all but a few, reviled by the majority of those who owed everything to him, is one of the most pathetic in history. End of chapter 22 Recording by Natasha Fisher at afishinthesea.me Chapter 23 of Good Stories for Great Birthdays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. August 20th, Bernardo O'Higgins, First Soldier, First Citizen of Chile. Since my childhood, I have loved Chile, and I have shed blood on the battlefields which secured her liberties. If it has not been my privilege to perfect her institutions, I have the satisfaction of knowing that I am leaving her free and independent, respected abroad, and glorious in her victories. I thank God for the favors he has granted my government, and pray that he may protect and guide those who will follow me. Bernardo O'Higgins to the Chilean Assembly O'Higgins The name of O'Higgins has a double luster because it was born by two generations with an almost equal brilliancy. It is seldom that a genius such as Ambrose O'Higgins the father, the greatest viceroy of royalist Spanish America, bears a man such as Bernardo O'Higgins the son, first chief of the new republic which sprang up from the ashes of his dead father's government. W. H. Cobo Bernardo O'Higgins alone was able to accomplish and establish the semblance of decent, dignified government in his country after the great upheaval, a fact mostly due to his own transparent honesty, utter unselfishness, and pure patriotism, as much to his own political acumen, diplomacy, and powers of organization. John G. Mahegan Bernardo O'Higgins was born August twentieth, 1778 became the hero of Rancagua, 1814. He and San Martin won the Battle of Chocoburo, February 12, 1817. First Independence Day in Chile, February 12, 1818. O'Higgins went into exile, 1823. He died in Peru, October 24, 1842. The Son of the Barefoot Boy Ambrose O'Higgins was like the bright lad in the fairy tale, who started out to seek his fortune with a knapsack on his back. Ambrose was only a servant boy in Ireland, barefoot some say, running errands for the lady of Castle Dangan in County Meath. Then one day he set out to seek his fortune in Spain where he had an uncle. He did not find it there. 
So he bought a stock of merchandise and took ship for South America, the wonderful country where, so people said, one could get treasure and emeralds aplenty. He landed at Buenos Aires and sold some of his goods. Then he crossed the Pampas or Prairie and packed his goods by mule train over the high Andes into Chile. Still, his treasure did not appear, and, being a venturesome lad, he made his way north to Lima in Peru. There he kept a small stall and peddled his wares under the shadow of Pizarro's ancient cathedral. As he looked up at its weather-beaten walls and down at his old clothes, little he dreamed that one day he should enter the door of that very cathedral, clad in a vice-king's garments and surrounded by a brilliant retinue of officers and retainers. Not knowing that all this wonderful thing was to happen, he grew restless and set off on his travels through Venezuela and New Granada, and finally went back to Chile. There his fortune was awaiting him. As the years passed, he studied and worked industriously, until he became a famous civil engineer and built roads and did great things for Chile. He devoted himself to Chile's interests until the King of Spain, learning of his genius and of all the improvements he had brought about in the country, had appointed him its governor. He served with such wisdom that, in time, he was made viceroy or vice-king of Peru, the highest and most coveted office in all Spanish America. So with pomp and procession, and a vice-king's garments, he entered the cathedral doors of the very city where once as a poor homeless boy he had peddled his wares. He died at a great age, full of honors, and left his estate to Bernardo, his son. Now Bernardo, his son, was anything but a royalist. He was a patriot. He felt no deep loyalty to the crown of Spain. He had been sent to London to study while he was only a boy. There he had met Miranda, the flaming son of liberty. Miranda had become his friend. Bernardo had joined his secret society to which Bolivar and Sad Martin belonged. Thus the boy, Bernardo O'Higgins, had enthusiastically pledged himself to help Spanish America gain her freedom. When his father died, he returned to Chile. He lived there for a while on his farm with his mother and sister Rosa. But he was not content to stay there long. So leaving the farm, he gave himself completely to the service of his country. And while San Martin, the Argentine general, was mobilizing his army at Mendoza on the other side of the Andes, O'Higgins and many Chilean patriots were endeavoring to drive the Spaniards out of their country northward and back to Lima. The Single Star Flag It was the 4th of July. The United States Consulate in Chile was celebrating our Independence Day. Over the consulate floated the stars and stripes, and with it was entwined, for the first time, a tricolored flag, red, white, and blue, with a single five-pointed silver star in its upper left-hand corner. It was the new Republican flag of Chile. Soon one saw the patriots of Santiago on the streets wearing red, white, and blue cockades, and shortly after the single star flag was adopted as the Chilean national emblem, the hero of Rancagua. But Spain was not going to permit Chile to hoist a flag of independence. She dispatched armed frigates and war vessels along the Pacific coast, for she was determined to crush the Patriot uprising once and for all. From her stronghold, Lima, she sent out fresh troops seasoned in European wars. The strong Spanish force marched down through Chile upon helpless Santiago City. The Patriot army, very small and badly equipped, took its stand bravely near the town of Rancagua, hoping to keep the Spanish from passing. Unfortunately, there were political quarrels among the patriots. The Carreras, three brothers, were trying to gain control of the government and army. Their personal ambition was greater than their love of the country. The patriot forces at Rancagua were in part commanded by two of the Carreras, and in part by O'Higgins of whom they were jealous. The Spanish attacked. A stiff battle took place. Neither army would give quarter. Each side hoisted a black flag as a signal of war to the death. Suddenly, without warning, the Carreras fell back and abandoned O'Higgins and his troops to their fate, leaving them trapped as it were. But O'Higgins and his men retreated to the town and defended themselves courageously. For hours, without cessation, the Spanish attacked. 
Finally, O'Higgins withdrew his men to the plaza and fought from behind hastily thrown up barricades built of carts, bricks, furniture, and parts of houses. Then a Chilean magazine exploded. The Patriots' ammunition began to give out. The buildings around them went up in flames. O'Higgins was shot in the leg. But he and all of his little band, of whom scarcely two hundred men were left, tortured by fatigue, thirst, and heat, still gallantly fought on. Destruction seemed certain, but O'Higgins was not a man to yield to despair. He ordered his men to collect all the horses, mules, and cattle they could lay hands on. He placed himself at the head of his men, and driving the herd before them, plunged through the Spanish lines, cutting fiercely on every side as he went. So he and his soldiers retreated safely to Santiago. But that city was doomed. The Spanish marched upon it and took it. All was terror. Many people fled from the city. Patriots who remained were seized by the Spanish and imprisoned or murdered. A number of men, some quite old, were banished to the lonely island of Juan Fernandez, Robinson Crusoe's desert island. As for Bernardo O'Higgins, he barely escaped with his life. He led a party of miserable, shivering refugees, men and women, across the Andes into Argentina. After terrible sufferings from cold in the high mountain passes, they reached Mendoza. There they were welcomed and sheltered by San Martin, the general whom God had called to carry liberty into Chile. Companions in Arms Then Argentina and Chile joined forces against Spain. O'Higgins and San Martin became companions in arms. About all that they accomplished, about the Hannibal of the Andes, Chacabuco, Maipu, and the strong fleet which O'Higgins assembled to carry San Martin and his army to Peru, you may read in the story of San Martin on page 235. There, also, it is told how O'Higgins became the supreme dictator of Chile, the land where his father, the barefoot boy, had found a fortune. The Patriot Ruler So while San Martin, with his army, sailed away to liberate Peru, the unselfish supreme dictator stayed at home to care for his people. Now that the Spanish were driven out, the country was in a chaotic condition, its laws and government in confusion. With wisdom, patience, and tact, O'Higgins began the work of reconstruction, and how well he succeeded, Captain Basil Hall, an English naval officer, tells in his journal. We left Valparaiso Harbor filled with shipping, its custom-house wharfs piled high with goods too numerous and bulky for the old warehouses. The road between the port and the capital was always crowded with convoys of mules loaded with every kind of foreign manufacture. While numerous ships were busy taking in cargoes of the wines, corn, and other articles, the growth of the country. And large sums of treasures were daily embarked for Europe in return for goods already distributed over the interior. A spirit of inquiry and intelligence animated the whole society. Schools were multiplied in every town, libraries established, and every encouragement given to literature and the arts. And as traveling was free, passports were unnecessary. And the matters, and even in the gait of every man, might be traced in the air of conscious freedom and independence. And all of this was largely due to the energetic and peaceful rule of Bernardo O'Higgins. But political enemies soon began to press the supreme dictator hard. There were conspiracies of the Carrera Party. Diplomatic misunderstandings arose between Chile and both the United States and England. Meanwhile, a more serious situation was developing which was to bring misery to Chile. The aristocrats, who had been royalists, began to work secretly against O'Higgins and the Republic. Government officials, who were jealous of O'Higgins' power and success, plotted against him. These conspirators succeeded in getting control of the Assembly. The Assembly demanded his resignation. O'Higgins knew that if he should refuse to resign, his act would plunge Chile into civil war. Rather than harm his country, he laid down his power. The people of Chile, who loved and revered him, wept with sorrow at his abdication. And his enemies would not have dared to attack him, had they not known that he would never have shed one drop of Chilean blood in his own defense. First soldier, first citizen. The rest is soon told. 
Bernardo O'Higgins, with his mother and his sister Rosa, went into exile. He sought refuge in Peru. He reached there after the amazing meeting. San Martin was gone. The Peruvians welcomed him with sincere hospitality. They gladly offered to shelter him in his exile. They gratefully acknowledged all that he had done to help equip the liberating army which had freed Peru. They gave him a fine sugar plantation and honored him in every way they could. So he lived quietly among them for many years. But things were not going well in the Republic of Chile. Her first place, which she had held among other southern republics because of their well-organized government and her fine civic reconstruction, the work of O'Higgins, this, her first place, was lost. She stood no longer at the head of her sister republics. She was become a prey to political quarrels. The Holy Alliance in Europe was threatening her. It was then that Chile received gladly the Monroe Doctrine of the United States, which protected her against Spain. Then Chile, in her trouble, recalled O'Higgins and voted to restore him to all his titles and honors. Though he loved Chile, he knew it was not best to return, so he refused, soon after which he died in Peru. He is, today, the beloved national hero of the Chilean people. Chile as she is. Sunny, happy, smiling Chile stretches like a broad ribbon unrolling itself along the Pacific coast of South America. Today she is a republic with a constitution and a president. Chile is a prosperous republic, for after civil war and political struggles, she has found herself, and is even stronger and more vigorous than under the role of Bernardo O'Higgins. High in her background loom the Andes, their jagged summits covered with eternal snows, while in their hearts are valleys, lakes, and rushing torrents, rich copper mines, and grazing grounds. Chile's immensely long and narrow land reaches from the hot and arid deserts of Peru to the cold and rainy country of Cape Horn. But the beautiful, sunny, happy Chile lies between those two extremes. In that delightful part grow barley, wheat, grapes, and herds of cattle and horses feed on the rich grass. Each year, Chile sends quantities of grain as well as iodine, nitrates, and wool to the markets of our United States and to those of other countries as well. In Chile, thousands of schoolchildren in the cities, towns, and villages are taught to honor the name of Bernardo O'Higgins, who founded their government, Chile's first soldier, first citizen. The children of Chile keep their Independence Day on February 12th, while our children in the United States are celebrating Lincoln's birthday. One of twenty. Chile is only one of twenty flourishing Latin American republics. They are called Latin American because they were settled by Latin races, Spanish, French, or Portuguese. There are eighteen Spanish American ones, one French, Haiti, and one Portuguese, Brazil. In these twenty republics there are more than seventy-five million people. This book is too short a one in which to tell about all the liberators of these republics. There was Toussaint Louverture, the extraordinary colored man, an ex-slave, who liberated Haiti. Haiti was the first Latin American republic to declare its independence. In Peru, there was Tupac Amaru, the brave young Indian cacique, a descendant of the Child of the Sun whom Pizarro conquered. He tried to liberate his people from Spain, but was captured with all his family and put to death. In Paraguay, there was the tyrant liberator Francia, about whom that fascinating romance in English, El Supremo, tells. While La Banda Oriental, as Uruguay used to be called, had for a liberator the bold bandit-like Artigas. In Mexico, it was the priest Hidalgo who roused the Mexican people to revolt against Spain. The peoples of the 18 Spanish-American republics are not one people like those of our United States, living at peace under one government and governed by one constitution. They are not a union. Instead, each is a separate republic. Each may do as it pleases without consulting the welfare of the others. This, at times, brings about bad feelings and even war. But to prevent war and bloodshed, some of these republics have adopted a better way. The better way. Today, high on a ridge in the Andes Mountains, high, high above the level of the sea, stands a gigantic bronze monument. 
It is a figure raised on a pedestal. In one hand it holds a cross, while it extends the other hand in blessing. The winter winds sweep against it with driving storms of snow. The summer winds whirl drifts of sand around its base. But with peaceful look, the figure gazes far beyond the black rocks, frozen peaks, and rushing torrents of the Andes, toward the busy world of men. On its base is inscribed, Sooner shall these mountains crumble into dust than Chileans and Argentines shall break the peace to which they have pledged themselves at the feet of Christ the Redeemer. It is the figure El Cristo of the Andes. It is a monument standing close to a lonely trail, once the highway from Argentina into Chile. It was erected a few years ago by the republics of Chile and Argentina. It happened this way. The two republics had disputed for years over the boundary line which passed along the crest of the Andes. Each claimed a large share of valuable territory. Neither would allow the other to settle the boundary line. Sometimes the Argentine soldiers patrolling the frontier would find the Chilean patrol camping on the disputed ground. These two patrols would have angry words and nearly come to blows. So the bad feeling grew worse until both the republics were ready for war. Then the Chileans and the Argentines remembered that their grandfathers and great-grandfathers, under San Martin and O'Higgins, had fought side by side and had shed their blood together in the cause of independence. They could not bring themselves to slaughter each other, for they were brothers. So they agreed to arbitrate. They appealed to England to decide the boundary line for them. King Edward the Seventh sent a commission to the Andes which surveyed the region to as far south as Cape Horn. The king gave his decision. Thus, the boundary line question was settled without bloodshed. Though Chile was not quite satisfied, she loyally stood by the king's decision. So the conflict was stopped, good feeling returned, and the republics were saved from the horrors of war. To commemorate this great event, the better way of settling a nation's quarrel by arbitration, the Argentines and the Chileans erected El Cristo. The figure was cast from the metal of old cannon left by the Spanish soldiers when they were driven from the land by O'Higgins and San Martin. It is twenty-six feet high and is mounted on a huge pedestal. Near it is set up a boundary marker inscribed on one side Chile and on the other side Argentina. El Cristo of the Andes was dedicated. Several thousand people were present. The vast solitudes of the Andes were broken. Cannon roared and bands played. Then the Bishop of Ancud spoke. Not only to Argentina and Chile, he said, do we dedicate this monument, but to the world, that from this it may learn the lessons of universal peace. Years have gone by since then. Today a railroad takes travelers over the mountains by another route. They no longer pass the bronze figure that pleads for peace. The peon, with the mailbag strapped on his back, has tramped his way for the last time down the rocky trail in winter snows, writes Mr. Nevino Winter, who has seen El Cristo. El Cristo stands among the lonely crags, deserted, isolated, and storm-swept, but ever with a noble dignity befitting the character. But Chile and Argentina have not yet forgotten their pledge. They are still showing the world the better way the way of arbitration and peace. End of section 23. Recording by Siobhan McAlpin. Chapter 24 of Good Stories for Great Birthdays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Good Stories for Great Birthdays by Francis Jenkins Olcott. September 6. The Marquis de Lafayette, The Friend of America. As soon as I heard of American independence, my heart was enlisted. Lafayette. Lafayette said when offering his services to Congress, after the sacrifices I have made, I have the right to exact two favors. One is to serve at my own expense. The other is to serve at first as volunteer. John Quincy Adams to Lafayette on bidding him farewell in 1825. Our children, in life and after death, shall claim you for our own. 
you are ours by that more than patriotic devotion with which you flew to the aid of our fathers at the crisis of their fate ours by that tie of love stronger than death which has linked your name for endless ages to come with the name of washington lafayette was born in france september sixth seventeen fifty seven he came to the rescue of america seventeen seventy seven he made his triumphal tour eighteen twenty four to eighteen twenty five he died in france may twentieth eighteen thirty four his full name was marie joseph paul yves roche gilbert de motier marquis de lafayette he preferred to be called plain citizen gilbert motier i will join the americans one night in seventeen seventy six the old marshal commander of the french forces at strasbourg was giving a dinner party in honor of the duke of gloucester this light-hearted english duke was in disgrace with his royal brother king george the third of england so he was taking a little trip abroad at the marshal's dinner he was maliciously regaling the guests with a humorous account of how the americans had flouted king george and had flung his chests of tea into boston harbor and had declared their independence the duke's sympathies were all with the americans and he dwelt on their need of volunteers amongst the guests officers in blue and silver strasbourg grandees in gold lace and velvet all exclaiming laughing and gesticulating was one silent solemn-faced young officer he was lean red-haired and hook-nosed and very awkward he kept his eager eyes fixed on the duke's face nobody noticed him after dinner he strode across the room to the duke and opened his lips for the first time i will join the americans i will help them fight for freedom he cried and as he spoke his face was illuminated tell me how to set about it the young man was the marquis de lafayette nineteen years old a rich french noble the adoring husband of a sweet young wife and the father of one little child edith seichel retold in america accompanied by baron de Kalb, lafayette safely reached america and presented his credentials to congress washington met him first at a dinner in philadelphia he was so pleased with lafayette's eager brave spirit and with his unselfish offer of sword and fortune for the american cause that he invited him to become a member of his family and to make headquarters his home lafayette was delighted and immediately had his luggage taken to the camp and from that time on he was always a welcome guest both at camp and at mount vernon on the field near camden what became of lafayette's companion the baron de kalb he served his adopted country the united states until at the battle near camden he fell still fighting though pierced by eleven wounds the rebel general the rebel general shouted the british soldiers who saw him fall and they rushed forward to transfix him with their bayonets but his faithful adjutant tried to throw himself on the baron's body to shield it crying out at the same time spare the baron de kalb the rough soldiers raised the wounded baron to his feet and leaning him against a wagon began to strip him just then the british general lord cornwallis rode up he saw his valiant enemy stripped to his shirt the blood pouring from his eleven wounds immediately he gave orders that the baron should be treated with respect and care i regret to see you so badly wounded he said but am glad to have defeated you the baron was carried to a bed he was given every care his devoted adjutant watched by his bedside and the british officers came to express their sympathy and regret but the brave baron lingered three days only then he died almost his last thoughts were with the men of his command he charged his adjutant to thank them for their valor and to bid them an affectionate farewell from him the people of camden erected a monument in memory of the baron de kalb the banner of the moravian nuns take thy banner and beneath the war clouds encircling wreath guard it till our homes are free guard it god will prosper thee take thy banner and if e'er thou shouldst press the soldier's bier and the muffled drum should beat to the tread of mournful feet 
then this crimson flag shall be martial cloak and shroud for thee and the warrior took that banner proud and it was his martial cloak and shroud from the hymn of the moravian nuns henry wadsworth longfellow it was the young and gallant marquis de lafayette who during the terrible rout on the field of brandywine leaped from his horse and sword in hand tried to rally the fleeing american soldiers but a musket ball passing through his leg he fell wounded to the ground his brave aide-de-camp placed lafayette on his own horse thus saving his life lafayette then tried to rejoin washington but his wound bled so badly that he had to stop and have his leg bandaged meanwhile it was growing dark all was fear and confusion around him the american soldiers were fleeing from every direction toward the village of chester they were rushing on in headlong flight with cannon and baggage wagons the thunder of the enemy's guns the clouds of dust the shouts and cries the general panic were terrific lafayette was forced to retreat with the army but in spite of his wound he retained presence of mind enough to station a guard at the bridge before chester with commands to keep all retreating soldiers from crossing it so when washington and general green rode up they were able to rally the soldiers and restore something like order as for lafayette he was soon after carried to the town of bethlehem in pennsylvania and left with the moravian nuns these good women nursed him and bestowed every kindly care upon him until his wound was healed and he was able to rejoin the army he had been serving without a command but after his gallant action at brandywine he was made head of a division it was while lafayette was still at bethlehem that a brilliant officer from the american army came to see him he was the lithuanian polish patriot count kazimir pulaski all the nuns and in fact everyone in bethlehem knew count pulaski's romantic history how while in poland he had fought for the independence of his country and had been sent into exile he was now fighting for america's liberty and when the nuns learned that count pulaski was raising a corps in baltimore they were eager to honor him with their own hands they made a banner of crimson silk embroidering it beautifully this they sent to him with their blessing he carried the crimson banner through battle and danger until at last he fell so badly wounded that he died the crimson banner was rescued and carried back to baltimore loyal to the chief it was during that terrible winter at valley forge that generals gates and conway with malice and duplicity were plotting against washington they wanted to win the young and influential marquis de lafayette to their conspiracy they planned to do so by separating him from washington so they used their influence to have him appointed to an independent command with conway as his chief lieutenant and this they did without consulting washington but they reckoned without their host the gallant young frenchman was loyal he was incapable of a dastardly act though scarcely twenty years old he had a mind of his own he refused to take command without washington's consent and insisted on having baron de kalb not conway for his lieutenant then he set out for york to get his papers he had left washington with the soldiers starving and shivering at valley forge he found general gates and his officers in york comfortably seated at dinner the table laden with food and drink they were flushed and noisy with wine and greeted lafayette with shouts of welcome they fawned upon him they complimented and toasted him he listened to them quietly and as soon as he received his papers rose as if to make a speech there was a breathless silence all eyes were fixed upon him in politest tones he reminded them that there was one toast that they had forgotten and which he now proposed the health of the commander-in-chief of the armies of the united states there was silence there was consternation and embarrassment no one dared refuse to drink some merely touched the glasses to their lips others set them down scarcely tasted then bowing with mock politeness and shrugging his shoulders lafayette left the dining hall and mounting his horse rode away john fisk and other sources retold we are grateful lafayette during the war for independence lafayette served without pay 
he also cheerfully expended one hundred and forty thousand dollars out of his own fortune purchasing a ship to bring him to america and raising equipping arming and clothing a regiment and when he landed in america he brought with him munitions of war which he presented to our army he gave shoes clothes and food to our naked suffering american soldiers after the war was over some small recognition was offered him by our government but while on his visit here in eighteen twenty five to show appreciation of his unselfish aid to us in time of need and in compensation for his expenditures congress passed a bill presenting him with two hundred thousand dollars and a grant of land there were however a few members of congress who violently opposed the bill much to the shame of all grateful citizens and one member of congress humiliated at this opposition tried to apologize delicately to lafayette i sir am one of the opposition exclaimed lafayette the gift is so munificent so far exceeding the services of the individual that had i been a member of congress i must have voted against it and to congress itself lafayette deeply touched said the immense and unexpected gift which in addition to former and considerable bounties it has pleased congress to confer upon me calls for the warmest acknowledgments of an old american soldier an adopted son of the united states two titles dearer to my heart than all the treasures in the world some of washington's hair cordial ties bound the land of washington to the land of bolivar one hundred years ago then the south american liberator was held in such high esteem here that after the death of washington his family sent bolivar several relics of the national hero of the united states including locks of washington's hair the gift was transmitted through lafayette who had it presented to bolivar by a french officer and the latter bore back to the noble french comrade of washington an eloquent letter of thanks from bolivar the south american liberator professed throughout his life ardent admiration for the united states and once in conversation with an american officer in peru prophesied that within one hundred years the land of washington would stand first in the world t r ibarra welcome friend of america eighteen twenty four to eighteen twenty five it was twenty five years after the death of washington it was eighteen twenty four in new york city joy bells were ringing bands playing cannon saluting flags waving and two hundred thousand people wildly cheering the marquise de lafayette was visiting america he was landing at the battery he was no longer the slender debonair young french officer who afire with ardent courage had served under washington but a man of sixty-seven large massive almost six feet tall his rugged face expressing a strong noble character his fine hazel eyes beaming with pleasure and affection but his manner was the same courtly gracious one of the young man of nineteen who so long ago had exclaimed i will join the americans i will help them fight for freedom since the american war for independence lafayette had been through the terrible french revolution and had spent five years in an austrian prison now as he landed once more on american soil he was the honored and idolized guest of millions of grateful citizens of the united states as he stepped from a gaily decorated boat and stood among the throngs of cheering new york folk his eyes filled with tears he had expected only a little welcome instead he found the whole nation waiting expectant and eager to do him honor his tour of the country in a barouche drawn by four white horses was one continuous procession enormous crowds gathered everywhere to greet him as he went from city to city town to town and village to village he passed beneath arches of flowers and arbors of evergreens children and young girls welcomed him with songs and officials with addresses he was banqueted and feted lafayette lafayette was the roar that went up from millions of throats at fort mchenry he was conducted into the tent that had been washington's during the war for independence there some of lafayette's old comrades in arms veteran members of the society of the cincinnati were awaiting him lafayette embraced them with tears of joy then looking around the tent and seeing some of washington's equipment 
he exclaimed in a subdued voice i remember i remember later in the day a procession was formed which as it passed through the streets of baltimore displayed in a place of honor the crimson silk banner of count pulaski embroidered for him by the moravian nuns of bethlehem pennsylvania in boston lafayette in a barouche drawn by four beautiful white horses was escorted by a brilliant procession through the streets at the common he passed between two lines of school children girls in white and boys in blue and white and a lovely little girl crowned him with a wreath of blossoms across washington street were thrown two arches decorated with flags and inscribed with the words welcome lafayette the fathers in glory shall sleep that gathered with thee to the fight but the sons will eternally keep the tablet of gratitude bright we bow not the neck and we bend not the knee but our hearts lafayette we surrender to thee and when he entered lexington he passed beneath an arch on which was written in flowers welcome friend of america to the birthplace of american liberty end of section twenty four chapter twenty five of good stories for great birthdays this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bo Wood. Good Stories for Great Birthdays by Francis Jenkins Alcott. September 24, John Marshall, the Expounder of the Constitution. I had grown up at a time when the maxim, united we stand, divided we fall, was the maxim of every orthodox American. And I had imbibed these sentiments so thoroughly that they constituted a part of my being. John Marshall He had a deep sense of moral and religious obligation and a love of truth constant, enduring, unflinching. It naturally gave rise to a sincerity of thought, purpose, expression, and conduct, which, though never severe, was always open, manly, and straightforward. Yet it was combined with such a gentle and bland demeanor that it never gave offense but it was, on the contrary, most persuasive in its appeals to the understanding. Justice Joseph Story John Marshall was born in Virginia, September 24, 1755. Became an officer in a company of Minutemen, 1775. Was envoy to France, 1797 was appointed Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States, 1801. He died July 6, 1835. The Boy of the Frontier In a Log Cabin Through the ancient and unbroken forest toward the Monongahela River, Braddock made his slow and painful way Weeks passed, then months, but the colonists felt no impatience because everybody knew what would happen when his scarlet columns should finally meet and throw themselves upon the enemy. Yet this meeting, when it came, proved to be one of the lesser tragedies of history and had a deep and fateful effect upon American public opinion and upon the life and future of the American people. Time has not dulled the vivid picture of that disaster, the golden sunshine of that July day, the pleasant murmur of the waters of the Monongahela, the silent and somber forest, the steady tramp, tramp of the British to the inspiriting music 
of their regimental bands, playing the martial airs of England. The bright uniforms of the advancing columns, giving to the background of stream and forest a touch of splendor, and then the ambush and surprise, the war hoops of savage foes that could not be seen, the hail of invisible death, no pellet of which went astray, the pathetic volleys which the doomed British troops fired at hidden antagonists, the panic, the rout, the pursuit, the slaughter, the crushing, humiliating defeat. Most of the British officers were killed or wounded as they vainly tried to halt the stampede. Braddock himself received a mortal hurt. Furious at what he felt was the stupidity and cowardice of the British regulars, the youthful Washington rode among the fear-frenzied Englishmen striving to save the day. Two horses were shot under him. Four bullets rent his uniform. But crazed with fright, the royal soldiers were beyond human control. Only the Virginia Rangers kept their heads and their courage. Obeying the shouted orders of their young commander, they threw themselves between the terror-stricken British and the savage victors, and, fighting behind trees and rocks, were an ever-moving rampart of fire that saved the flying remnants of the English troops. But for Washington and his rangers, Braddock's whole force would have been annihilated. So everywhere went up the cry, The British are beaten! At first, rumor had it that the whole force was destroyed and that Washington had been killed in action. But soon another word followed, hard upon this error, the word that the boyish Virginia captain and his rangers had fought with coolness, skill, and courage, that they alone had prevented the extinction of the British regulars. Thus it was that the American colonists suddenly came to think that they themselves must be their own defenders. It was a revelation, all the more impressive because it was so abrupt, unexpected, and dramatic, that the red-coated professional soldiers were not the unconquerable warriors the colonists had been told they were. From colonial mansion to log cabin, from the provincial capitals to the mean and exposed frontier settlements, Braddock's defeat sowed the seed of the idea that Americans must depend upon themselves. Close upon the heels of this epic-making event, John Marshall came into the world. He was born in a little log cabin in what is now a part of Virginia, 11 weeks after Braddock's defeat. The Marshall cabin stood about a mile and a half from a cluster of a dozen similar log structures, a little settlement practically on the frontier. Off to the Blue Ridge. Some ten years after Braddock's defeat, we can picture a strong, rude wagon drawn by two horses crawling along the stumpy, rock-roughened, and mud-mired road through the dense woods that led to a valley in the Blue Ridge Mountains. In the wagon sat a young woman. By her side, a sturdy, red-cheeked boy looked out with alert but quiet interest, showing from his brilliant black eyes. And three other children cried their delight or vexation as the hours wore on. The red-cheeked boy was John Marshall. In this wagon, too, were piled the little family's household goods. By the side of the wagon strode a young man dressed in the costume of the frontier. Tall, broad shoulder, lithe hipped, erect, he was a very oak of a man. 
His splendid head was carried with a peculiar dignity, and the grave but kindly command that shone from his face, together with the brooding thoughtfulness and fearless light of his striking eyes, would have singled him out in any assemblage as a man to be respected and trusted. A Negro drove the team, and a Negro girl walked behind. So went little John Marshall with his father and mother from the log cabin to their new Blue Ridge home, which was not a log cabin but a frame house built of whipsawed uprights and boards. Making an American John Marshall lived near the frontier until he was 19, when, as lieutenant of the famous Culpeper Minutemen, he marched away to battle. And during those 19 years, he had been growing up to be an American. The earliest stories told little John Marshall must have been frontier ones of daring and sacrifice. Almost from the homemade cradle, he was taught the idea of American solidarity. Braddock's defeat was the theme of fireside talk of the colonist, and from this grew in time the conviction that Americans, if united, could not only protect their homes from the savages and the French, but could defeat, if need be, the British themselves. So thought John Marshall's father and mother, and so they taught their children. For the most part, the boys' days were spent studying and reading, or rifle in hand in the surrounding mountains and by the pleasant waters that flowed through the valley of his forest home. He helped his mother, of course, did the innumerable chores which the day's work required, and looked after the younger children. He ate game from the forest and fish from the stream. Bear meat was plentiful. Whether at home with his mother or on surveying trips with his father, the boy continually was under the influence and direction of hardy, clear-minded, unusual parents. Their lofty and simple ideals, their rational thinking, their unbending uprightness, their religious convictions, these were the intellectual companions of John Marshall's childhood and youth. Give me liberty. Thomas Marshall, John's father, served in the Virginia House of Burgesses, of which Patrick Henry was a member. When Thomas Marshall returned to his Blue Ridge home, he described, of course, the scenes he had witnessed and taken part in. The heart of his son thrilled, we may be sure, as he listened to his father reciting Patrick Henry's words of fire. And again, when Patrick Henry became the voice of America, and offered the resolutions for arming and defense, and carried them with that amazing speech, ending with, Give me liberty, or give me death. Thomas Marshall sat beneath its spell. And John Marshall, now 19 years old, heard those words from his father's lips as the family clustered around the fireside of Oak Hill, their Blue Ridge home. The effect on John Marshall's mind and spirit was heroic and profound. Albert J. Beveridge arranged. The Young Lieutenant When John Marshall was 19, he was about six feet high, straight and rather slender, and of dark complexion. His eyes were dark to blackness, strong and penetrating, beaming with intelligence and good nature. His raven black hair was of unusual thickness. He was lieutenant of a company 
and wore a purple or pale blue hunting shirt and trousers of the same material fringed with white. A round black hat with a bucktail for a cockade crowned his figure. The news of the Battle of Lexington reached him, and he was soon on the muster field training his company. First, he made his men a speech, telling them that he had come to meet them as fellow soldiers who were likely to be called on to defend their country and their own rights and liberties, that there had been a battle at Lexington in which the Americans were victorious, but that more fighting was expected, that soldiers were called for, and that it was time to brighten their firearms and learn to use them in the field, and that if they would fall into a single line, he would show them the new manual exercise for which purpose he had brought his own gun. Then, before he required the men to imitate him, he went through the manual exercise by word and motion, deliberately pronounced and performed. He then proceeded to exercise them with the most perfect temper. Never did man possess a temper more happy or one more subdued or better disciplined. After a few lessons, he dismissed the company, saying that if they wished to hear more about the war, he would tell them what he understood about it. The men formed a circle about him, and he talked to them for about an hour. After that, he challenged an acquaintance to a game of quoits, and they closed the day with foot races and other athletic exercises. Horace Binney retold. Serving the Cause Young John Marshall became a lieutenant in the 1st Regiment of Minutemen raised in Virginia. These were the citizen soldiery of the colonies who were raised in a minute, armed in a minute, marched in a minute, fought in a minute, and vanquished in a minute. His father, Thomas Marshall, was major of this Virginia regiment of Minutemen. Their appearance was calculated to strike terror into the hearts of an enemy. They were dressed in green hunting shirts, homespun, home woven, and homemade, with the words liberty or death in large white letters on their bosoms. They wore in their hats bucktails and in their belts tomahawks and scalping knives. Their savage, warlike appearance excited the terror of the inhabitants as they marched through the country. Lord Dunmore told his troops before the action at the Great Bridge that if they fell into the hands of the shirt men, they would be scalped. To the honor of the shirt men, it should be observed that they treated the British prisoners with great kindness, a kindness which was felt and gratefully acknowledged. Henry Flanders Arranged At Valley Forge, through the battles of Iron Hill, of Brandywine, of Germantown, and of Monmouth, John Marshall bore himself bravely. And through the dreary privations, the hunger, and the nakedness of that ghastly winter at Valley Forge, his patient endurance and his cheeriness bespoke the very sweetest temper that ever man was blessed with. So long as any lived to speak, men would tell how he was loved by the soldiers and by his brother officers, how he was the arbiter of their differences and the composer of their disputes. And when called to act, as he often was, as judge advocate, he exercised that peculiar and delicate judgment required of him, who is not only the prosecutor, but the protector of the accused. It was in the duties of this office that he first met and came to know well the two men 
whom of all others on earth he most admired and loved, and whose impress he bore through his life, Washington and Hamilton. William Henry Rawl, Arranged Silver Heels Young John Marshall surpassed in athletics any man in the army. When the soldiers were idle at their quarters, it was usual for the officers to engage in a game of quoits or in jumping and racing. Then he would throw a quoit farther and beat at a race any other. He was the only man who, with a running jump, could clear a stick laid on the heads of two men as tall as himself. On one occasion, he ran a race in his stocking feet with a comrade. His mother, in knitting his stockings, had knit the legs of blue yarn and the heels of white. Because of this and because he always won the races, the soldiers called him Silver Heels. J.B. Thayer Arranged Without bread, told by John Marshall's sister. He was then an officer in the American Army, and he came home for a visit accompanied by some of his brother officers, some young French gentlemen. When supper time arrived, mother had the meal prepared for them and had made into bread a little flour, the last she had, which had been saved for such an occasion. The little ones cried for some, and Brother John inquired into matters. He would eat no more of the bread, which could not be shared with us. He was greatly distressed at the straits to which the fortunes of war had reduced us, and Mother had not intended him to know our condition. From the Green Bag his mother, John Marshall's mother, Mary Isham Keith, was a woman of great force of character and strong religious faith. She was pleasing in mind, person, and manners, and her son loved her with that chivalrous, tender devotion which made him gentle with all women throughout his life. A few weeks before his death, John Marshall told his friend, Judge Story, that he had never failed to repeat each night through his long life the little prayer which begins, Now I lay me down to sleep, that he had learned when a baby at his mother's knee. Sally E. Marshall Hardy arranged. His Father his father, Thomas Marshall, served with great distinction during the War for Independence. He was a man of uncommon capacity and vigor of intellect. John Marshall, after he became Chief Justice, used often to speak of him in terms of the deepest affection and reverence. Indeed, he never named his father without dwelling on his character, with a fond and winning enthusiasm. My father, he would say, with kindled feelings and emphasis, my father was a far abler man than any of his sons. To him, I owe the solid foundation of all my own success in life. Justice Joseph Story, condensed. Three stories. What? was in the saddlebags. One autumn, John Marshall was invited to visit Mount Vernon in company with Washington's nephew. On their way to Mount Vernon, the two travelers met with a misadventure which gave great amusement to Washington and of which he enjoyed telling his friends. They came on horseback and carried but one pair of saddlebags each using one side. Arriving thoroughly drenched by rain, they were shown to a chamber to change their garments. One opened his side of the bags and drew forth a black bottle of whiskey. 
He insisted that he had opened his companion's repository. Unlocking the other side, they found a big twist of tobacco, some cornbread, and the equipment of a pack saddle. They had exchanged saddlebags with some traveler and now had to appear in a ludicrous misfit of borrowed clothes. Eating Cherries After the war, John Marshall studied law and began practice in Virginia courts. He served in many important offices, both of his state and of the nation. Here is a little story told of him when he first began his practice. At that time, he was very simple, though neat, in his dress. He was one morning strolling, we are told, through the streets of Richmond, attired in a plain linen roundabout and shorts, with his hat under his arm, from which he was eating cherries. When he stopped in the porch of the Eagle Hotel, indulged in a little pleasantry with the landlord, and then passed on. A gentleman from the country was present who had a case coming on before the Court of Appeals and was referred by the landlord to Marshall as the best lawyer to employ. But the careless, languid air of Marshall had so prejudiced the man that he refused to employ him. The clerk, when this client entered the courtroom, also recommended Marshall, but the other would have none of him. A venerable-looking lawyer with powdered wig and in black cloth soon entered, and the gentleman engaged him. In the first case that came up, this man and Marshall spoke on opposite sides. The gentleman listened saw his mistake and secured Marshall at once, frankly telling him the whole story and adding that while he had come with $100 to pay his lawyer, he had but $5 left. Marshall good-naturedly took this and helped in the case. Learned in the Law of Nations In time, John Marshall became a great lawyer. He declined the office of district attorney of the United States at Richmond, that of attorney general of the United States, and that of minister to France, all offered him by Washington. When President Adams persuaded him to go as envoy to France, he wrote to another envoy of General Marshall, as he was then called, from his rank of Brigadier General in the Virginia Militia. He is a plain man, very sensible, cautious, guarded, and learned in the law of nations. James B. Thayer arranged. The Constitution As the British Constitution is the most subtle organism which has proceeded from progressive history, so the American Constitution is the most wonderful work ever struck off at a given time by the brain and purpose of man. William Ewart Gladstone A Constitution, says the dictionary, is the fundamental organic law or principles of government of a nation, state, society, or other organized body of men. Also, a written instrument embodying such law. This is not so hard to understand. The first statement may be applied to the English Constitution, which is not a written document like ours. It is, instead, a vast body of laws and judicial decisions which, accumulating through the centuries and beginning long before the time of the Magna Carta, have been handed down from one generation to another. On the other hand, the second statement in the dictionary may be applied to the Constitution of the United States, which is a document, a written instrument, framed and adopted for our protection 
by those able and noble patriots who met in the federal convention over which George Washington himself presided. They were wise men, learned in the law and far-sighted. They planned a government for the great future of a very great free people. Since its adoption, other republics of the world have used our Constitution as a model for their own. Our Constitution guarantees self-government and regulates just government. It is the foundation of our national life. Without it, we should be threatened with anarchy. Anarchy means universal confusion, terror, bloodshed, lawlessness of every description, and the destruction of religion, education, business, and of everything which makes life and home beautiful and safe. After we had declared our independence and won our liberty, this country was threatened with anarchy because we had as yet no constitution to regulate government, and each state did much as it pleased. But after the Constitution was adopted and the states were united and had become one people under one government, order, peace, and prosperity resulted. Thus, the amazingly rapid growth of our beloved country, as Washington called it, is due to the safeguards of that most precious document, the Constitution of the United States. For which reason, every boy and girl should read it carefully, should regard it with reverence, and should surround it with every protection, as being, with the blessing of God, the source of the life and welfare of our nation. As for John Marshall, he did not help to frame the Constitution, but it was largely through his efforts and those of James Madison that the Virginia State Legislature ratified it. In another way, also, he had a great part in its making. After the Constitution was adopted, being a new document, there existed no body of judicial decisions interpreting its meanings, like the decisions of England, which guided English judges. A body of American decisions had to be made to interpret our Constitution in order to guide American judges. This was John Marshall's great work. In 1801, President John Adams called the profound lawyer John Marshall to be Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. It was a most wise appointment, as we shall now see. Expounding the Constitution Chief Justice Marshall took his place at the head of the national judiciary. The government, under the Constitution, was only organized 12 years before, and in the interval... Eleven amendments of the Constitution had been regularly proposed and adopted. Comparatively, nothing had been done judicially to define the powers or develop the resources of the Constitution. In short, the nation, the Constitution, and the laws were in their infancy. Under these circumstances, it was most fortunate for the country that the great Chief Justice retained his high position for 34 years, and that during all that time, with scarcely any interruption, he kept on with the work he showed himself so competent to perform. As year after year went by, and new occasion required, with his irresistible logic enforced by his cogent English, he developed the hidden treasures of the Constitution, demonstrated its capacities, and showed beyond all possibility of doubt that a government rightfully administered under its authority could protect itself against itself and against the world. Hardly a day now passes in the court he so dignified and adorned without reference to some decision of his time 
as establishing a principle which, from that day to this, has been accepted as undoubted law. In all the various questions of constitutional, international, and general law, the Chief Justice was at home, and when, at the end of his long and eminent career, he laid down his life, he and those who had so ably assisted him in his great work had the right to say that the judicial power of the United States had been carefully preserved and wisely administered. The nation can never honor him or them too much for the work they accomplished. Chief Justice Waite arranged. The Great Chief Justice I have always thought from my earliest youth till now that the greatest scourge an angry heaven ever inflicted upon an ungrateful and a sinning people was an ignorant, a corrupt, or a dependent judiciary. John Marshall Respected by all, when the venerable life of the Chief Justice was near its close, he was called to give his parting counsel to his native state in the revision of her constitution, a spectacle of greater dignity than the Convention of Virginia in the year 1829 has rarely been exhibited. At its head was James Monroe, conducted to the chair by James Madison and John Marshall, and surrounded by the strength of Virginia, including many of the greatest names of the Union. The reverence manifested for Chief Justice Marshall was one of the most beautiful features of the scene. The gentleness of his temper, the purity of his motives, the sincerity of his convictions, and his wisdom were confessed by all. He stood in the center of his native state, in his very home of fifty years, surrounded by men who had known him as long as they had known anything, and there was no one to rise up even to question his opinions without a tribute to his personal excellence. The True Man This admirable man, extraordinary in the powers of his mind, illustrious by his services, exalted by his public station, was one of the most warm-hearted, unassuming, and excellent of men. His life from youth to old age was one unbroken harmony of mind, affections, principles, and manners. His kinsman says of him, He had no phrase in boyhood. He had no quarrels or outbreakings in manhood. He was the composer of strifes. He spoke ill of no man. He meddled not with their affairs. He viewed their worst deeds through the medium of charity. Another of his intimate personal friends has said of him, in private life he was upright and scrupulously just in all his transactions. His friendships were ardent, sincere, and constant. His charity and benevolence unbounded. Magnanimous and forgiving, he never bore malice. Religious from sentiment and reflection, he was a Christian, believed in the gospel, and practiced its tenets. Horace Binney condensed. What of the Constitution? The unity of government which constitutes you, one people, is also now dear to you. It is justly so, for it is a main pillar in the edifice of your real independence, the support of your tranquility at home, your peace abroad, of your safety, of your prosperity, of that very liberty which you so highly prize. To the efficacy and permanency of your union, a government for the whole is indispensable. Washington from his farewell address. To me, it is a marvel 
that the Constitution of the United States has operated so successfully. But the United States is a singular example of political virtue and moral rectitude. That nation has been cradled in liberty, has been nurtured in liberty, and has been maintained by pure liberty. I will add that the people of the United States are unique in the history of the human race. Simone Bolivar, The Liberator Let us make our generation one of the strongest and brightest links in that golden chain which is destined, I fondly believe, to grapple the people of all the states to this Constitution for ages to come. We have a great, popular constitutional government, defended by the affections of the whole people. No monarchical throne presses these states together. No iron chain of military power encircles them. They live and stand under a government popular in its form, representative in its character, founded upon principles of equality, and so constructed, we hope, as to last forever. Its daily respiration is liberty and patriotism. Its yet youthful veins are full of enterprise, courage, and honorable love of glory and renown. Daniel Webster May our children and our children's children for a thousand generations continue to enjoy the benefits conferred upon us by a united country and have cause yet to rejoice under those glorious institutions bequeathed us by Washington and his compeers. Now, my friends, soldiers and citizens, I can only say once more, farewell. Abraham Lincoln Envoy God of our fathers, whose almighty hand leads forth in beauty all the starry band of shining worlds in splendor through the skies, our grateful songs before thy throne arise. Thy love divine hath led us in the past. In this free land, by thee our lot is cast. Be thou our ruler, guardian, guide, and stay. Thy word our law, thy paths our chosen way. From war's alarms, from deadly pestilence, be thy strong arm our ever sure defense. Thy true religion in our hearts increase. Thy bounteous goodness nourish us in peace. Refresh thy people on their toilsome way. Lead us from night to never-ending day. Fill all our lives with love and grace divine. And glory, laud, and praise be ever thine. D.C. Roberts 1876 End of chapter 25 Recording by Bo Wood End of Good Stories for Great Birthdays by Francis Jenkins Alcott